asked me to come give a talk and um I think um, the topic itself um, is one of those topics that one is interested in, in terms of what is the role of endoscope in infertile patients. And I think we we all do endoscope one way or the other, especially after completion of uh, our MMET of COG. And we are all exposed to patients that will come with infertility. And uh, I think the majority of us, even though the training of endoscopic skills uh, in the postgraduate level is not adequate, but uh, we all do some form of endoscopy. And the question is whether whatever it is that we're doing is something that's relevant to our patients or it's something that we do because we want to monetize the practice. But I just want to discuss what is it that we can do for patients who present with infertility in terms of endoscopic wires. Uh, in my presentation, my first slide will be uh, I just want to uh, show colleagues that uh, uh, the role of endoscopy has been investigated for some time. Uh, when you look at uh, a paper by David Cunning, which was pu published in Fertility and Sterility in the 1980s, they looked at uh, the combined laparoscopy hysteroscopy in the investigation of the ovulatory infertile uh, patients. And it has been shown then that um, if you look at, if you compare hysteroscopy and hysterosalpingogram in the detection of intrauterine lesions, hysteroscopy was superior. The reason why hysteroscopy is gold standard for intracavitary lesions. But they had almost 169 patients where they wanted to investigate for causes of infertility in their group of patients, and they realize that when you do laparoscopy, hysteroscopy, uh, you tend to increase the detection rate for pathology. Where if you do laparoscopy only, you'll get 49.4% of pathology. When you do combination of hysteroplascopy, uh, the pathology detection will increase to 66%. And uh, the, 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 the argument is that advanced for replacement of hysterosalpingogram with combination of laparoscopy, hysteroscopy, the primary means for investigating ovulatory infertile, infertile patients. And this was done in 1980. So the question is whether uh, uh, laparotomy is still uh, um, um, advocated for patients with infertility. There was a paper uh, by uh, Alan DeCheney, uh, where it was titled, The Leader of the Band is Tired, which was published in Fertility in 1985. Uh, uh, DeCheney, a quote, said that uh, the obituary of laparotomy for pelvic reconstructive surgery has been written. It is only his publication that remains. And he said this because um, we know people like uh, Ketsem in uh, 1974, he reported the performance of myomectomy, wolferectomy, adnexectomy, and uh, salpingectomy, and removal of avariances with endocoagulation, endorouter in 1974. And uh, we know that uh, IVF uh, represents a popular and effective option for many couples uh, with infertility. The question is whether uh, assisted reproductive technology, will it render laparoscopy a similar fate in the context of fertility treatment? And uh, this is a subject that we can debate because uh, laparoscopy has been replaced by laparoscopy for fertility. Now there's ART. So is ART going to replace laparoscopy? I think um, in my presentation, I'll try to elucidate this. So to define a few things, uh, of importance is that uh, infertility is a disease ca characterized by failure to establish a clinical pregnancy after 12 months of regular unprotected sexual intercourse. Uh, but we, 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 we need to note that 12 months, fertility interventions may be initiated in less than 12 months uh, based on medical sexual and reproductive history and the age of the patient and the physical findings and diagnostic testing. Therefore, if one presents to you at six months, she's 38 years of age, you can't tell them, go back home, go and try for 12 months before I can do anything. Uh, according to the definition, uh, infertility is 12 months. If there's any other 
clinical signs that uh, suggested that this patient might be infertile due to uh, this particular pathology. Therefore, one needs to be investigated earlier on than to tell, send them home. And I think uh, we all do the or have the same approach to an infertile couple where we take history, we examine, we investigate, we do blood tests, and um, we do non-invasive uh, investigation. Non-invasive uh, uh, in investigation are relatively less expensive compared to laparoscopy, but diagnostic laparoscopy, which is often combined with hysteroscopy, is useful in ruling out Mullerian anomalies and re relieving, uh, revealing pelvic uh, uh, pathology and assessing tubal function. Uh, I think in this era of improved imaging, uh, the role of diagnostic laparoscopy, which is more invasive and expensive, has been questioned. There's especially so when there's initial uh, clinical evalu evaluation and imaging that fail to show any abnormalities. So when you look at a uh, diagnostic hysteroscopy, is 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 under investigative because people are not doing anything. You just want to diagnose. Is there a role of diagnostic endoscopy in 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 the in, in our era? I don't think so. Therefore, I think the aim of management is to uh, have a successful uh, live birth rate. Therefore, the reason why people do IVF versus V uh, diagnostic diagnostic doesn't really help you. So we should move away from doing diagnostic procedures to operative laparoscopy plus manas hysteroscopy. So operative laparoscopy is the option uh, or management of choice for these patients to say, am I going to do IVF or am I going to do operative hysteroscopy? So what is the role of laparoscopy in, uh, in this patient? Uh, I think we know that laparoscopy represent uh, an alternative to IVF for women affected with fibroids, uh, endometriosis, and is an adjunct for improving IVF treatment success in women with hydrosalpinges. And it provides direct visualization of the pelvic organs. And uh, you can, one can uh, one cannot exclude the complications. As with laparoscopy, you've got anesthetic complications, you've got cost implications, and you've got um, adhesion uh, 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 formations with uh, endoscopy. But uh, all these other conditions that are mentioned, like uh, myomectomies, reversal of sterilizations, uh, uh, ovarian drilling for patients with uh, polycystic ovarian tumors, uh, tuboplasties or, or, or neosalpingostomies for patients with uh, hydrosalpinges can benefit for, from, from, from laparoscopy. Not forgetting that patients with deep endometriosis also do benefit, especially in the hands of uh, skilled surgeons. Uh, people think deep endometriosis can be done by any other surgeon, but you need to be trained. You must have the skill, must have the love for the disease because uh, most often you're going to do uh, minimal or incomplete surgery if you don't know what you're doing. So majority of these patients um, will prefer uh, laparoscopy versus V IVF because uh, when they present to us, they will tell you that IVF is natural. It's not natural, especially in the province where I practice. You find that the majority of men, they say IVF babies are not normal babies, are not natural babies. They want to try to conceive naturally. Therefore, endoscopy is a role in those type of patients where they, they think and refuse uh, assisted reproductive technology techniques. And uh, it, it does offer an alternative to, to, to IVF. I mean, if a patient comes to you because we look at IVF in terms of the cost implications, they say, I don't have any other form of uh, cash flow except my medical aid. And uh, uh, I've been told that I do have a pathology that can be treatable or amenable to laparoscopy. Therefore, you need to offer them endoscopic surgery so as to try and improve their uh, fertility rates. And uh, uh, we know that IVF also, uh, laparoscopy does improve IVF treatment success, especially in patients with hydrosalpinges. It has been shown that if you remove uh, hydrosalpinges, you tend to increase uh, the pregnancy rate by 50% in patients with uh, uh, hydrosalpinges. And we know that laparoscopy, there's no ethical issues to address in, 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 in laparoscopy. You just have to take a proper consent uh, stating to the patient the, 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 the complications of the procedure and the post-op uh, uh, care of the procedure and your intra-op uh, intra findings. 
And unlike uh, um, uh, IVF or, or, uh, or assisted reproductive te uh, technology techniques, one needs to take proper consent and there's uh, ethical implications related to the oocytes themselves, uh, sperm frozen, the embryo frozen, the procedure, in case they separate, there might be issues when it comes to those frozen embryos and you find that the couple is no longer um, uh, in a relationship. But if you do laparoscopy, then there are no ethical issues to address. And some patients might conceive more than once so if you do proper lap uh, endoscopic procedure for whatever pathology that they have. So laparoscopy, I think, does uh, have a role in, in, in fertile patients. So when you look at tubal disease, this is a patient uh, that presented with uh, with hydrosalpinges, um, uh, and she also had uh, fibroids. And uh, of note, uh, she was told that uh, uh, they can do uh, uh, IVF and the hydrosalpinges will be removed later. But the patient unfortunately insisted on having embryo transfers without surgery, and nothing much uh, uh, happened in terms of implantation rate, and uh, unfortunately, she also had fibroids that uh, were in contact with the cavity. Therefore, we had to remove the 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 tube on the left side, and also did a myomectomy for her. But what I wanted to show you is that you need to differentiate between phimosis and hydrosal hydrosalpinges. Phimosis is incomplete or partial uh, tubal obstruction, and it's really amenable to surgery uh, since tubal mucosa is not damaged in the vast majority of cases. While hydrosalpinges on the right side of the screen, uh, there's complete tubal obstruction and must be diagnosed because it's le if left untreated, it may impair the results of uh, IVF. And the other problem with um, hysteroscopy without laparoscopy is that if you do uh, hysteroscopy only, these patients, if you do look at the cavity, look at the tubal ostia, everything looks normal. There are no obvious pathologies, but the importance is that if you do laparoscopy, you can see that this patient has got uh, what we call uh, salpingitis, ismicus nodosum of the left tube, and she also has um, hydrosalpinges uh, of the right tube. Therefore, this patient will benefit uh, greatly from uh, 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 laparoscopy and most probably bilateral salpingectomy. Uh, sal and uh, IVF uh, will also improve a uh, success rate. So literature says hydrosalpingis has uh, negative consequences in terms of implantation rates, uh, pregnancy rates, and delivery rates. The observed reduction in pregnancy rates uh, is not ameliorated by IVF. At least eight separate uh, studies demonstrate a decline in IVF pregnancy rate in the presence of uh, hydrosalpingis with a consistent of 50% reduction in these studies. So one needs to see and remove hydrosalpinges because of uh, the reduction by 50% in terms of IVF success. And uh, there were three uh, um, randomized control trials uh, that looked at uh, salpingectomy, which was shown to be effective in improving the odds of achieving pregnancy. And a pooled analysis of this study showed uh, that salpingectomy from, for hydrosalpings uh, resulted in 1.5-fold and 2.13-fold odds of pregnancy and live birth, respectively. Uh, and, and it has been shown that uh, salpingectomy does not appear to negatively affect ovarian response to gonadotropins. So what about uh, fibroids and infertility? Uh, the, there's a lot of publications looking at the impact or, or, or the effect of fibroids and, and, and infertility. Uh, but of note is that um, it has been shown that the fibroids that have an impact or do have an effect are the ones that affect the cavity or in, in, in contact with the cavity. And it is important that when we do hysteroscopy, it's it, 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 is, it is of paramount importance when you dilate. It's not easy for one to see the fibroids when you use high pressure uh, during insufflation and direct visualization or uh, uh, vaginos vaginoscopy technique. So you need to try and do vaginoscopy technique, go in, reduce the pressure. Then as you reduce the pressure, intercavitary pressure, you can see that this patient has got a fibroid. Uh, it's not a type zero. Most likely the type type two, because uh, more than fifty percent uh, is in the in the intramural. 
Uh, so this is a patient where the fibroid was missed, a laparotomy done. Unfortunately, they missed this fibroid, was not removed, and uh, she attempted IVF. Unfortunately, it was unsuccessful. And the picture on the right shows the same fate that this patient, if we do a stereoscope without looking, you are going, unfortunately going to miss the presence of a type uh, type 2 fibroid because of a high pressure. So I'll try and fast forward. As you decrease the pressure, you can see the fibroid on the right side. So it's very important to do a, a hysteroscopy, uh, insufflate, uh, increase the, the, the pressure so that you can see the cavity. But before you go out, try and reduce the pressure, look for obvious pathologies, and these patients will benefit from a hysteroscopic uh, or a resection of the, the fibroid or resectoscope. So fibroids that have an impact on fertility are uh, FIGO, uh, uh, that's zero, one, two, and three. Those are the ones which have an impact on the endometrial cavity. Zero, one, two, they are in the cavity. Three is in contact with the cavity. The rest of the fibroids I want to show you based on the research that was done, whether is it necessary or not necessary to remove them. But the ones that have a, a definite impact on, on fertility, uh, uh, figure zero, one, two, and three, therefore they need to be removed. So when you look at submucosal fibroids, studies by Preds, Penneke, and Sunkara, uh, they said fibroids that impinge upon the endometrial cavity have a poor reproductive outcome than those without. And removal of these submucosal fibroids to, uh, seem to benefit IVF patients. What about those patients with the uh, intramural fibroids? I mean, this patient had an intramural fibroid, which was a cap 4, uh, but 10 by 10 centimeter in size. So laparoscopy was done, the fibroid was removed. Uh, she was struggling to conceive for some time, and uh, the fibroid was removed, and uh, she, the cavity was closed in layers. Uh, she, we did three layers for her because it was a huge fibroid, and uh, the plan was to immediately do tubal patency testing to see if the, 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 there is no effect or impact on the uh, tubal, uh, uh, tubal ostia or, or, or um, distal or proximal tubal uh, occlusion. And uh, at the end of the procedure, the right tube, uh, there was a spillage of blue dye, and the uh, patient was advised to at least um, stay three months on contraceptives or protective intercourse so as to heal before they can attempt uh, conception. So when you look at the uh, publication, uh, there was a study done by, um, a meta-analysis done by Sunkara uh, in uh, 2010, where they looked at the effect of uh, intramural fibroids uh, without uterine cavity involvement on the outcome of IVF treatment. It was a systemic review and meta-analysis. And uh, the conclusion was that the presence of non-cavity distorting intramural fibroids is associated with adverse pregnancy outcome in women undergoing IVF. A follow-up uh, study by uh, Somigliano looking at fibroids not encroaching the endometrial cavity and IVF success rate, which was a prospective study. Uh, they looked at also the size of the fibroids, uh, those below five uh, millimeters. And their conclusion was that in asymptomatic patients selected for IVF, small fibroids not encroaching the endometrial cavity did not impact on the success rate uh, uh, of the procedure. Therefore, this was a follow-up study. But Sunkara did a study earlier on, later by uh, Robilla, which, uh, um, despite the, 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 the fact that uh, uh, fibroids do have an impact, and Sumitiana said fibroids didn't have an impact. And when we look at the guidelines for, for by, by, by practice committee of American Society of Reproductive Medicine, looking at the removal of myomas in asymptomatic patients to improve fertility and or reduce miscarriage rate. The, the recommendation is that um, in asymptomatic women with uh, cavity distorting myomas, intramural with a submucosal component or submucosal, myomectomy either by open or laparoscopic or hysteroscopic may be considered to improve uh, pregnancy rate. And myomectomy is generally not advised to improve pregnancy outcomes in asymptomatic women with uh, with non-cavity distorting myomas. 
However, myomectomy may be reasonable in some circumstances, including but not limited to severe distortion of the pelvic architecture, complicating access to the ovaries for oocyte retrieval. So if you're asymptomatic, cavity distorting, you remove. Asymptomatic, non-cavity distorting is advisable not to remove. But if there's any distortion of the uh, pelvic architecture, it's advisable to remove. So this is a patient that um, uh, was referred to me because of uh, they were attempting to do um, uh, open myomectomy. Unfortunately, at the entry, uh, she had a funny still incision. Uh, the surgeon noticed that there's pelvic adhesions and uh, she was later closed, referred to me uh, for most probably uh, severe endometriosis. Unfortunately, the patient, I think uh, during the examination, the vaginal examination was not done because she had a huge central nodule at uh, vaginal examination. Uh, which was tender, and she also gave a history suggestive of endometriosis, uh, chronic pelvic pain, dysmenorrhea, uh, dyspareunia, infertility. And as you can see on the video, you can't really even see the tube. You can't see tube on the left. You can't see the uterus. Everything has been pulled centrally. This is a sigmoid, which has, uh, is attached to the left side. When you do uh, blunt dissection with a suction and a, 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 a soft a tissue grasp, but you can see that the uterus is there. You can see the femoral and there. This is the bladder attached to almost the fundus of the uterus, sigmoid. Um, such patients I tend to operate with the surgeon, and you can see the fibroid that was seen on the on ultrasound. This is the fibroid, almost three by three centimeter fibroid, used as or more type type five uh, fibroid, that was the one that was wanted to be removed. And you can see that uh, this patient, almost everything is uh, medialized, there's severe adhesions, uh, dissection of the ureter on the left side, dissection of parietal space, uh, both ovaries were suspended. Uh, and um, this is the part of that that was created. So she had a vaginal and retrocervical lesion that was removed uh, laparoscopically. This is a huge lesion, as you can see, more retrocervical than vaginal. But because it involved the vagina, the vagina was opened, uh, uh, the lesion was removed, the vagina was closed. Fast forward, uh, also did uh, some rectal shaving of the lesion. Um, my tumor was done because the fibroid was there and she thought the fibroid is a cause of um, 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 infertility, which was not related. The cause of infertility was the endometriosis. And um, she also had uh, peritoneal uh, uh, bladder endometriosis, which was uh, removed or shaved or resected. Uh, of note, as you can see, she had a small endometrium on the right side, but uh, this is what uh, happened after surgery, you can see the tube there on the right looks normal. This tube, you couldn't visualize it at all pre-surgery uh, or intraoperative before we started. This is the rectum, part of that last uterus there, ovaries, ovaries, both tubes are fine and both tubes were patent. So the question, what is endometriosis? I think we all know that it is a chronic disease uh, that uh, requires a lifelong management plan with the goal of minimizing the use of medical uh, treatment and avoiding repeated surgery. So what does Cochrane say about uh, endometriosis and, 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 and laparoscopy? So um, Bafford Cillian uh, on the, uh, did a, um, a Cochrane review looking at the laparoscopic surgery for endometriosis and uh, compared uh, to, to diagnosis laparoscopy. Uh, it was uncertain whether laparoscopic surgery reduces overall pain associated with minimal to severe endometriosis. But there's moderate uh, quality evidence that laparoscopic surgery improves viable intrauterine pregnancy confirmed by ultrasound associated with minimal to uh, mild endometriosis when compared to diagnostic laparoscopy alone. So there's very low quality evidence that laparoscopic excision and ablation are similar effectively in re relieving pain Though there was only one relevant study, it is not possible to draw conclusion with regard to treatment of severe endometriosis, which specific laparoscopic surgical intervention is most effective, or whether other holistic or medical treatment models are more effective than laparoscopic surgery. No conclusion can be made with regard to adverse events. 
So careful participant selection, adequate surgical experience and appropriate equipment are important in ensuring that these techniques are useful, usefully applied. So the other Cochrane um, 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 uh, review, looking at the intervention for women with endometriomas part two assisted reproductive technology, the author concluded that there's no evidence uh, that the generic antagonist for endometrioma prior to ART provides a more favorable outcome than the use of generic agonists with regard to clinical pregnancy rate and occurrence of miscarriages. Uh, laparoscopic aspiration or cystectomy for endometrioma prior to ART did not show evidence of benefit over expectant management with regard to clinical pregnancy rate. In one trial, there was evidence that laparoscopic aspiration improved the ovarian response and it had a positive treatment effect on the number of mature oocyte retrieves compared to generation antagonist. And one trial showed that ovarian response to control ovarian was greater than expectant management uh, than the after cystectomy. But there's no evidence of effect that aspiration of endometrioma prior to ART provides an increase in outcome compared to expectant management on the clinical pregnancy rate and occurrence of miscarriages. And we need to also consider uh, uh, other factors prior to surgery. Uh, whether this patient is symptomatic, uh, you also need to look at the age of the patient, you need to look at the ovarian reserve, uh, you also need to look at the size of the endometrioma, not forgetting whether it is unilateral or bilateral. You need to ask whether she had previous surgery for endometrioma. You need to think about the cancer risks. Therefore, you can't just see a patient with endometrioma and just, you know, say because the evidence says there's no benefit. You need to individualize these patients. And we know that there's uh, benefits to surgery in terms of uh, surgery. Uh, will help in terms of prevention of uh, possible rupture of the endometrioma, and it facilitates oocyte retrieval. And uh, if you do biopsy, you can detect occult uh, malignancy because this patient's almost 2% uh, at risk of getting end endometrioid, endometrioid, endometrioid endo um, 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 cancers of the ovary. And it also does avoid contamination of uh, follicular fluid with endometrioma content, therefore also preventing progression of the disease if you do surgery on these patients. When you look at um, uh, Jacques Donnet, um, uh, said uh, uh, in, in, in infertile women with endometrioma larger than three centimeters, there is no evidence that cystectomy prior to treatment with ART improved uh, pregnancy rate. Uh, and, in, and in women with endometrioma larger than three centimeters, you need to consider cystectomy prior to ART to improve endometriosis associated pain or accessibility of follicles. And there's evidence that suggests that SAGE does not benefit asymptomatic women with an endometrial prior to scheduling for IVF. So which patients will benefit from um, uh, um, uh, ovarian drilling? So if a patient has got clomiphen uh, citrate resistance, these are the poor predictors for ovarian drilling. I think uh, we shouldn't be offering patients ovarian drilling for everyone because I've seen patients who have six 10, 12, 20 holes, bilateral ovaries, uh, trying to do ovarian drilling. So ovarian drilling is done on the one ovary, preferably uh, four holes, 40 watts, four seconds. And you need to rinse the ovary so as to cool because the energy that we use is, uh, uh, is very detrimental to, 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 to the follicles. So these are the poor predictors for success of ovarian drilling. So a patient that presents with more than three years of infertility with a BMI above 25, with a, a free androgen index more than 15, LH more than 10, and the MH more than 7.7 .7 nanograms. So it's been shown that these patients tend not to do well with the, um, um, for, for ovarian drilling. So my last slide is I started with the first slide to show that the um, uh, and laparoscopy has been uh, investigated for some time. Um, <laughs> an author, Maharan Ahmad, looked at the, the issue whether does laparoscopy still has a role in modern fertility practice. And to conclude is that uh, laparoscopy still has an important role in the diagnosis and treatment of infertility. Therefore, we cannot exclude and ignore laparoscopy because there's ART. So to conclude, uh, laparoscopy provides a mechanism to diagnose and treat underlying pelvic pathology. 
that uh, may be causative for infertility as well as other symptoms, thereby optimizing both spontaneous and assisted uh, pregnancy rates. Assisted reproductive technology and laparoscopy are not mutually exclusive, but coexist and uh, potentially complementary treatments. The choice of approach is an individual one, uh, made in the context of complexity of medical, social, and financial variables uh, that are unique to each couple. With proper patient selection, laparoscopy represents an effective option for optimizing pregnancy potential that we anticipate uh, will retain its viability well into the future. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Ndlovu, uh, for the talk that you've given us. Thank you. I hope you enjoy us a Saturday. You don't go cycling too much this weekend, but enjoy it. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Maxwell Chimina. Dr. Maxwell Chimina is one of our fellows in the unit. He's a gynecology oncology fellow. He qualified in Zimbabwe and he came and joined us as a fellow in the unit. And um, he's going to talk to us this morning about a paradigm shift in the management of endometrial carcinoma. We see a lot of endometrial carcinoma probably due to lifestyle, but it's one of the cancers that we see commonly. And Dr. Chamina will be addressing us as to the paradigm shift, what we need to know, what is the latest development in terms of endometrial cancer. Over to you, Dr. Chamina. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Prof. Mfundo, for the kind introduction. Uh, and uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to make this presentation. I welcome you all. I understand this is a varied uh, audience. Some are here in person and some are online. But um, today I'm going to talk on the paradigm shift in the management of endometrial cancer. And I've already been introduced. So I have no disclosures to make at this point in time. I'm not conflicted at all. Uh, so this is the outline of my presentation. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the background of uh, endometrial cancer, what has been happening before, what we are currently doing, and what we envisage to do in the future. And after that, I will then conclude my discussion and open the floor for any for any discussion. So just to get the ball rolling, um, this uh, global chart or global map uh, shows uh, the incidence of endometrial cancer. And what I wanted to highlight on this slide is, although endometrial cancer uh, is quite common, it is incredibly common, mainly in the affluent society, as you can see from this diagram. Uh, you can see it's more common in uh, Europe, it's more common in America, but coming close home uh, to South Africa, you can see it is one of the leading countries with endomet endometrial cancer in terms of incidence. And this diagram by, this, di this global map by IAC and WHO shows that in 20, Twenty, there were more than 400,000 cases of endometrial cancer death globally and more than 90,000 death. And just I have highlighted that uh, South Africa is the leading, one of the leading uh, countries in Africa. And you can see the incidence here for, for South Africa. Then in terms of 
sorry. Okay, and in terms of the mortality, you can see again uh, countries in Europe and America, they have the leading uh, mortality death. It's a bit, the mortality, although it's higher there, it's not like, let me know, say it's not very bad because of the way endometrial cancer presents. These patients typically present with uh, abnormal bleeding or postmenopausal bleeding. So they tend to present early and management is instituted earlier. So this diagram, as you can see, this is now in South Africa. It is the fifth most common uh, cancer year in South Africa after breast, cervical, colorectal, and lung. And uh, at some point in time, as gynecologists or as uh, medical practitioners who encounter a patient with endometrial cancer, uh, and any woman who has a womb is at risk of getting this cancer. And because of the increasing proportion of obesity and uh, increasing uh, lifespan, most the incidence continues to rise. So what has been happening before? Uh, I think we are all aware of uh, this binary classification that was proposed by Bokam, I think in 1983, that is about 40, 41 years ago when he decided, when he uh, he come with this dichotomous uh, classification of endometrial cancer, they being type one and type two. Type one being the one that we commonly see in patients who are a bit younger, around 50 to 60, who are obese. And this one is mainly related to unopposed estrogen or where there is hyperestrogenemia, and also related to some hereditary conditions like Lynch and Caudian syndrome with a precursor lesion of uh, endometrial hyperplasia. Uh, with atypia, and these ones were usually these well differentiated uh, adenocarcinomas, the grade one and the grade two, and uh, with a good or favorable prognosis that were diagnosed early, and uh, which were on a background of uh, this IBMI. And then you also pinned the type two, uh, which tend to occur later on, on a background of uh, endometrial atrophy, and they were a bit less well defined. And the surrogate was kind of our serous carcinoma, clear cell carcinosarcoma. And this one had P53 mutations. And most of them, they were diagnosed already with extra uterine uh, disease or in the, the poor prognosis. However, this binary or dichotomous classification had so many pitfalls because remember, it was mainly, this was also based on histology. And you know, histology, especially grade, is poorly reproducible. And uh, you can see. In some studies, I think they were like 60% uh, concordance, meaning that there will be like 40% discordance in terms of pathological review. So this inconsistency is, was a problem in terms of uh, how patients were going to receive adjuvant treatment. And also in clinical trials, because of this heterogeneous group of uh, patients. However, I think I will be able to clarify a little bit when I now go on to the molecular classification that we are supposed to embrace now. So this diagram, I think this is uh, what we do every day uh, when we encounter a patient whom we suspect is endometrial cancer, with, usually with this abnormal or postmenopausal bleeding, uh, where we do an endometrial biopsy, be it on an endo cell or on a, or, or on a hysteroscopy. Uh, sometimes the DGNC, but as I've always told registrars, a DGNC is now dead and cremated. We rarely use it in uh, modern day obstetric, but there are some times when it's indicated to do a DGNC. Then after the biopsy, we get a pathological diagnosis, and then wake up the patient doing our hematological and radiological investigations. Where indicated, we go on to do advanced imaging, uh, like MRI, CT scan, to look for any evidence of metastatic or extra uterine disease. Then after that, you kind of get a, a bit of clinical staging because remember endometrial cancer is surgically staged. Then after that, we we'll then go on to offer surgery. Because surgery is the cornerstone of treatment for endometrial cancer. Uh, and I think this has been kind of been led to rest the type of surgery that we do. Ideally, the standard of care would be to do a minimally invasive surgery, be it conventional laparoscopy or robotic surgery. 
with uh, BSO and lymph node assessment. So in terms of lymph node assessment, I think things are moving forward. We can do it as Sentinel. Uh, some can do a uh, selective or we can do uh, all the patients that we encounter. But I think we're moving towards now more towards Sentinel lymph node assessment. Then in terms of ovarian preservation, because remember most of the time we do a BSO, we can preserve ovaries. If these patients are less than 45 years, and it's a grade one with less than 50% myonetra invasion and no obvious risk of extra uterine disease or a genetic risk of cancer. So after surgery, this is how we've been triaging our patients for adjuvant treatment. I think uh, our new registrar had an opportunity to, to see this uh, being applied on Thursday. Uh, so after surgery, we'll prognosticate our patients into a low risk group, intermediate risk, high intermediate or high risk. This is by ESGO. So for the, this, as you can see, it was mainly using the histological type, the lipovascular space invasion, the grade of the tumor, and the depth of myometrial invasion. And as I've already said, there were some challenges in terms of reproducibility of the grade, and sometimes it's in the depth of the myometrial invasion. After this, we then assess the, the histology and classify these patients. So patients uh, after this would then be decided which patients are going to receive adjuvant therapy or not. So this is how we we'll do it. Patients with low risk, we usually cancel them. They will be for routine follow-up and there will be no need for adjuvant treatment. Then for intermediate risk patients, these patients will cancel them. Usually we'll either, we can omit adjuvant treatment for these patients. However, age is a very critical factor when we decide if a patient is above skist, their risk is high. So these patients usually cancel them and refer them for adjuvant vaginal brachy. I think there have been different um, protocols. I think we have also another Mayo, we have a POTEC criteria to decide which highlights the importance of age in these patients. So for those with high intermediate, usually we'll give them uh, adjuvant vaginal brachy. External beam can also be given, especially if they are stage two or the substantial lymphovascular space invasion. Yes, there's also room to give adjuvant chemo. For this patient also, we can omit adjuvant treatment, but after adequate counseling of these patients. Then for patients with high risk, as we've seen from this, um, this table, all of them will, if, will receive adjuvant, will receive adjuvant, adjuvant treatment. So this is now where my presentation comes in. So I think this was a this was a, a, a landmark trial, uh, the the cancer genome atlas. It was published in 2013. Initially, they were uh, looking for cancers that had poor prognosis of public health importance and where they were available for samples meeting standards of quality control. I think it changed the way uh, we look at it at, at, and manage uh, cancers. It really opened um, uh, 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 our management towards precision medicine. And so when they, one of the things that happened is Endometrial cancer was part of the cancers that were looked at in the cancer genome atlas. They looked at uh, around 232 uh, endometrial cancers. And what they found was really appalling and uh, very interesting. They realized that endometrial cancers, don't, they don't behave the same. There were actually four distinct classes of endometrial cancers. And as you can see, these are the classes that they, in terms of the molecular profile, we had the poor ultra mutated, the microsatellite instability, the copy number low, and the copy number high. What they did, they looked at the genomics, transcriptonomics, and proteonomics for these cancers, and also their histology. And what they found, for example, for the poor mutated, ultra mutated cancers, they found, you can see here, the AFA high mutational burden, if you look at them, that's why they are ultra mutated, more than 100 mutations per megabase. And for these ones, if you look 
at these tumors, when you look at the grade here, like tumor grade, most of them, the endometrial grade three, as you can see from here. And then we have a lot of lymphovascular space invasion and tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And they were, of those 232, they constituted 17% of the cases, which is about 8%. Although they look horrible when you look at their characteristics, they tend to have a very good prognosis, as I will show you when I'm discussing my mayor Kaplan curves. So these ones, they tend to okay in a bit, women who are a bit thin and a bit shy. Then the next quarter on this board was these ones, which is microsatellite instability. You can see their mutational burden is quite high, about 10 to 100 mutations per megabase. And this, for those 232, they constituted 62% of the cases. And these ones are usually related to Lynch, where there is mismatch repair deficiency. And they also, if you look at their histological grade and you compare to this here, most of them, they're also grade three, they have tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And they are, in terms of the outcome, they tend to have an intermediate prognosis. And then this group now, for the copy number law, you can see their mutational burden is a bit low, less than 10 mutations per megabyte and there were 90, which correlated to around 45%. These are the bulky majority of the patients that you see. And these ones, the patients that are usually youngish with high BMI, and they tend to have estrogen and progesterone receptor positive uh, uh, tumors. And then the last group, as you can see, is color-coded red. Yeah, it's a problem. Uh, these cancers are uh, high grade. Like you can see this serous like, and they constituted about 60% of the cohort which is around 18%. These ones, they are the one with usually with P53 abnormal and they have a poor prognosis. And for some reason, I managed to find out how they color coded these, 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 these tumors because you can see that initially I was telling my colleague that maybe these were kind of avid sports fan in terms of teams. I think people know which team wears blue and is doing well in terms of. Uh, the game. So after this uh, assessment of the of these results, I think I told you about the Gokam classification. Now you can see from this uh, diagram, not all endometrial cancers are the same. What you see here is those Gokam units describe them into two types: type one and type two. But now that we have the molecular profile. You can see that not all type 1 have a favorable prognosis because some of these type 1 they have this P53 abnormal, which, as I have said, has a poor prognosis. Some of them has mismatch repair deficiency. Some of them has no specific molecular profile, which gives them intermediate prognosis. Yes, those ones with a poor mute have, we have a favorable prognosis. So sometimes a patient can come and they, we think, ah, this is just a grade 1 and a grade 2. But when you profile their molecular, we realize, oh, the P53, which makes them have a very bad outcome. And also, some of the type 2s that we're saying they have a poor prognosis, some of them you can see they, they are poor outramitated, so they will have a favorable outcome. And as you can see, I put grade 3 here, because initially grade 3 was classified as a type 2 by Bocam, but it tends to be the most heterogeneous uh, sub subgroup. Because as you can see, almost it is equally divided in terms of these molecular profiles. If you see, it's 10 to 50 percent. We have no specific molecular profile. 10 to 50, we have mismatch repair. So this one is the one that actually benefits most from this molecular uh, profiling. This grade three, we cannot just put it as a type two because you can see it's evenly distributed. So after this, it. This opened uh, us towards to move towards precision medicine. So this is just a summary of what I was saying, that of these 232, about 8% of them were co-ultra mutated, about 30% of them had MSI, and then about the bulk majority of them, the 90, which is about 50%, had copy number low, and then the remaining, about 18%, were serious like or P53 abnormal. What this information highlighted to us, as you can see from this uh, Mayor Kaplan, uh, uh, Kaplan Mayor story graph, is this, this is the poor ultra mutated. It is a good 
uh, as I was saying, you can see from the progression free survival, it's almost 100%. And, and this, they were not, this was from the cancer genome atlas. They were not looking at the stage of the patients. And then we look for those who had mismatch repair deficiency and those with copy number low, the intermediate uh, prognosis or progression free survival was intermediate. But those that had P53 abnormal or copy number high or serious like, you can see there, the, the worst outcome. So armed with this uh, information, there was a, other trials were done in different parts. This was the PROMIS trial uh, that was done, uh, where they looked at the initial assemble of 509, but you can see the, but the eventual assess, assessment was done on 452, or well, some of these were unclassified. So this number, the final assessment was done on 452 clients. They replicated the same information that was produced from the Cancer Genome Atlas, and even the percentages of the people were the same. And you can see this one with a uh, copy number low, the one that I said is the common one that we kind of encounter in practice. They were the bulky, here they constitute about 40% of the cohort. And this one's also about 80% of the cohort, those that had uh, poor, and those that had mismatch, around 30%. So they replicated the same, the same information. So also in terms of their oncological outcomes for these patients, I think you can see from this diagram that uh, the blue one is those that were poor ultra mutated. You can see it is a good overall survival, followed by those that were uh, P53 wild type and those that were uh, mismatch repair deficient, these ones, and those that it P53 abnormal is the worst outcome, as you can see from this from this diagram in terms of the overall survival. They also looked at other oncological outcomes like uh, progression free survival, which was almost the same as we saw in the in the in the cancer the cancer genome atlas results. And then they also looked at the disease specific survival, patients with poor yet favorable prognosis as well. And then this is just a summary. So that you can see this picture of you of these uh, uh, Kaplan mayor 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 graphs to see how patients with poor ultra mutated endometrial cancers yes fairly good oncologic outcomes followed by those that had uh, mismatch repair or MSI then the last and the worst one as you can see from all these graphs those ones with P53 abnormal. So what is happening now, after get, now that we have this background knowledge? So the risk stratification has changed, as you can see. If we know the molecular classification, I think you remember I told you about this initially, but now that we now know if we em embrace the molecular classification, this risk profiling changes drastically. So as you can see from here, uh, you can see this is patients that have poor mutation in their stage one or stage two, they automatically go into the low risk group. But previously, these patients, let's say with stage two here, without knowing the molecular classification, were in the high intermediate and we're sending these patients for adjuvant treatment. So it means we de-escalate the treatment for these patients. So this is how it has changed. And also in that regard, Patients who also have abnormal P53, even though they were here as low risk and stage one, the moment they become, they have P53 abnormal with any myometrial invasion, they automatically become high risk. And these patients will actually need external beam, uh, beam therapy. So this is how the knowledge of this molecular classification has kind of been a, a game changer in the management of endometrial cancers. So it that would de-escalate, or we upscale the management of these patients depending on what we have found on the molecular profile of the cancer. However, let me also hasten to say the knowledge of this mismatch repair deficiency or no specific molecular profile does not alter this the risk group of the patient, but it would be good to be able to cancel the patient and also to decide Sometimes the need for adjuvant treatment, because let's say someone has mismatch repair and we eventually test and they have Lynch syndrome, we'll be able to then 
manage their family and also decide which are different treatments they will benefit. Both some of them can benefit from uh, immunotherapy, et cetera, et cetera. So this is why it is now very important that we know the molecular profile of these endometrial cancers. So this flowchart uh, from the British Gynecology Cancer Society, uh, the reason why I put it or added on this slide is it is very important that it is not, we cannot only do the molecular profile on the final hysterectomy specimen. We can also do these molecular profiles on the biopsy. Like when you take an endo cell or we do a hysteroscopy, we can actually do the molecular profile on the specimen. It has been noted that there is high confidence between the biopsy that we do, those office biopsy that we do, and the final histological specimen in terms of the molecular profile. So when we have this on a biopsy, it will also help us to cancel the patient. Let's say we do an endometrial biopsy, the molecular profile says P53. Automatically, it will help us to cancel the patient that, Mama, uh, we are dealing with a high risk in terms of the risk prognostication. And it also help us to plan our surgery and also to think about our adjuvant treatment and the agents of the surgery. So that is why this uh, molecular uh, profile has kind of opened uh, the dynamics in terms of management of uh, endometrial cancer. It has also changed the way endometrial cancer staging is now affected. I think uh, Professor uh, Berek and his team, they did an amazing job to come up with this uh, new staging. It looks cumbersome, but it's, it's, it's doable. This is the new staging as of FIGO 2023 that they came up with this sub uh, classification, looking into those things like lymphovascular space invasion, uh, ovarian involvement, all those things. But this is when you don't know the molecular classification. If we know the molecular classification, this staging also changes, as you can see in this diagram. So if we know the molecular classification, this is what will happen. Stage one and stage two automatically changes. So if a patient is a disease that is confined to the uterus or cervix, they are, and they are poor, mutated, they will become stage 1A. If the patient is P53 abnormal, they automatically become stage 2C, So, which is different. I think you can see from this graph. If, let's say this, let me just take this example. If this patient is none, it's 1A1, but when you do the molecular profile, it's P53 abnormal. This patient automatically become a 2C. And if this patient who is, uh, let's say, a serious histology and we're saying is stage 2C, is poor, it automatically becomes a stage 1A. So you can see how this molecular classification is uh, changed uh, the way uh, endometrial cancer management is affected. So in terms of uh, treatment, I think they've been... Uh, uh, it is also, as I've said, it has also changed the way we decide which patient to give a driven treatment and also which are driven treatment to give. I think you can see from this uh, kaplan mayer caves uh, that patients with P53, they tend to benefit more from combination adjuvant treatment after surgery as compared to those that who just get, let's say, radiotherapy alone. So the knowledge of this abnormal P53 also helps us in deciding which adjuvant treatment to give to this patient. So it is important. I think you can see uh, from this, these patients received uh, radiotherapy alone, and this one received con uh, concurrent chemo radiation, and their uh, recurrence uh, automatically changed. And you can see this gap is open in this uh, Kaplan Mayer case. This was the results from the 43 study. So what am I saying in summary? Uh, not all endometrial cancers behave the same. It can be a one shoe fits for size fits for. So complete molecular classification is of paramount importance. It will help us to prognosticate our patient and to decide which adjuvant treatment we are going to give. And as I've said, co-mutated endometrial cancers have a favorable prognosis. Those with mismatch uh, repair deficiency or no specific molecular
molecular profile as an intermediate prognosis. However, those with abnormal P53 have the worst prognosis. So this will also help us to cancel our patient, triage our patients for adjuvant treatment. And uh, uh, in L endometrial cancer, presence of poor mutation or abnormal P53 now modifies the fecal stage as I highlighted in the staging of uh, in the new and modified endometrial cancer stage. And beyond, uh, a lot of work is being done in endometrial cancer. It's, it, the road has been long, but it seems it's progressing well. There are these trials that are also ongoing currently and recruiting like the Protect 4A, the Rainbow Study and others. And I think these ones also help us to decide uh, which are given treatment and also how to cancel our patients, as you can see uh, from, from, this, from, from, from this diagram. So the landmark of endometrial cancer uh, is rapidly evolved and uh, treatment should now be, we are moving towards precision medicine. So we should also embrace that. I think there are also sometimes challenges in the state in terms of getting these molecular profiles. But I think at the end of the day, uh, with a combined effort, we will get there and it will help us to better manage our patients in the future. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Dr. Chimina. Um, I'm sure all of us are now clear as to the management of um, endometrial cancer and the paradigm shift that is there. I think you've made it simple, you've made it understandable, and I think most of us will be able to relate to that, and I'm happy that I see a lot of people in the room nodding as well. We will have a short break, um, a tea break. Uh, I think it's now, um, it's now 10 past um, 10. I would suggest that you come back at half past 10. Let's have a, a short break, have tea and enjoy and digest the paradigm shift, the role of laparoscopy in the management of infertility, talk around those things while we have tea. Hopefully we'll have time at the end of the session to raise our questions. Thank you, let's have tea.
You remember who you are. I often wish hope is that way.
How's it for Dal? How's it for Nisha? I'm good. Good. Thanks. Just, making, yeah. just making sure the two of you are around or whatever. Yeah, cool. Okay. Cool. All right. Thanks. I uh, can't hear you, Fidel. You're just unmuted. Um, are you able to hear me now, James? Uh, so, uh, I still can't hear you, Fidel. Um, It looks like from our side, Fidel, that you have got um, you are on. It might just be your microphone, Fidel. Let me check. Like that. There go. I hear you now. Cool. I hear you. Oh, perfect. There we go. Cool. Awesome. There we go. Cool. I'll come on in about two minutes' time. Prof. Vengi will come back. Cool. All right.
Um, <clears throat> welcome back. Welcome back. I hope I hope you enjoyed your tea and uh, welcome back. At this time, I'm going to uh, hand over to Fadel Solomon. You remember when we started, we gave Dr. Potriter, our treasurer, a few moments um, to speak, and we did mention that our meeting uh, this morning is sponsored by CIPLA. And I think it's appropriate for me at this stage to give Fadel Solomon um, an opportunity to say something to us. Over to you, Fadel. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Um, James, am I audible? Yes, you are. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much, everyone. Uh, um, I think this morning has uh, kicked off to a really excellent start as well with uh, um, Dr. Jackson and Dr. Maxwell delivering some insightful presentations thus far. So I'd like to thank everyone for joining today's session, and I'm honored to introduce CIPLA, um, the sponsor of SASOG CPD meetings. And to CIPLA, we understand the importance of these meetings, and we'd love to be continue being a part of these SASOG CPD meetings. Um, I just quickly like to give you guys a brief uh, um, on CIPLA. So CIPLA is not just uh, um, uh, James. If we can maybe just go to the first slide, please. Thank you. So CIPLA is not just a name in the pharmaceutical industry. It's a global leader with over eighty-five years of expertise. Um, with 46 manufacturing facilities worldwide and over 25,000 employees and operations in more than 80 countries. CIPLA's mission is clear. It's to make a difference through innovative, accessible healthcare solutions from research to manufacturing. CIPLA's commitment to quality and patient care is at the forefront of everything CIPLA does. Um, and Jason, if we, James, if we can just go to the next slide, please. So CIPLA is a company deeply committed to advancing women's health. Um, CIPLA recognizes the critical issues women faces at various life stages that they go through, such as contraception, menopause, infertility, endometriosis, cancer, and weight management. Thus, um, CIPLA's goal is to provide a comprehensive solution that, that empowers healthcare professionals like you to addressing these key areas to improve quality of life for women everywhere. And with that, I'd like to the, then hand over to Dr. Felicia um, to take us further through today's uh, CPD meetings. Thank you guys for allowing me to have this minute or two. But then, um... I, I think I should mention that we are very happy with the SASO Council and the arrangement of this meeting, and thank you to the SASO XMK for arranging it. Currently, we have about 223 people online, and um, I think my, my room here is also full. And thank you um, for attending, and thank you for coming to listen to our great speakers, and I'm sure you've had a, a great time this morning, and um, speakers speak <coughs> very, very well. And it is my pleasure to introduce um, a friend, also and a colleague, a fellow registrar when we're in the, at the University of Pretoria, uh, Dr. Felicia Mulukwane. Felicia Mulukwane is um, working at Galafong Hospital. She's a certified phytomaternal uh, specialist there. And um, I am very pleased and happy to have her uh, talk to us in the Eastern Cape and to the entire um, community of uh, members Sasok, who are listening online as well. Felicia, thank you, and over to you. Thank you uh, for your warm introduction, Dr. Uh, Prof. Mabenge. Um, good morning, colleagues. Uh, for this morning, uh, my talk will be on progesterone supplementation during pregnancy. I hope with this talk we'll be able to understand its role and in, its importance uh, um, in pregnancy. So <clears throat> with uh, regards to the introduction, we all know that uh, progesterone is actually one of the vital hormone in pregnancy. 
it plays really an, a key um, vital role in preparing the uterus for implementation and at the same time trying to actually even maintain uh, what you call a healthy pregnancy. And um, the natural produ uh, pro progesterone production is actually really secreted by the corpus luteum in early uh, phases of pregnancy. And then around uh, 10 to 12 weeks, the placenta uh, takes over the production of progesterone. The main function of the progesterone is actually really uh, to help with the thickening and stability of the uterine uh, lining in order for the embryo to implant uh, properly. And then at the same time, it helps in terms of uh, preventing premature contractions. And by this, it has been shown to uh, reduce some risk of miscarriages and even uh, preterm uh, birth. And then the other important things with the function of progesterone, it's mainly the uh, support of the immune tolerance of the fetus. It really uh, helps uh, for the mother not to see the fetus as a, a foreign uh, uh, substance. And during pregnancy, the other function for the progesterone, it helps in terms of inhibiting lactation uh, during pregnancy. We have uh, two types of progesterone uh, supplementation, which is the natural and the synthetic uh, progesterone. The natural uh, progesterone, it's, uh, that, these are the chemicals that uh, really looks like uh, they, they're produced by the body. And they are available as a form of um, micronized vaginal gel or even pessaries or, or some tablets. And mainly this one really helps with the suppression of the myometrial contractility. Whereas the synthetic one, these are the progesterones that are artificially uh, manufactured by the laboratory. And the ones that we know commonly a lot is the IM1, which is 17 oxyhydrogen uh, pro uh, uh, progesterone uh, separate. And recently, it has been withdrawn uh, from the FDA drug list in 2023. And the oral one that is quite available and that is used a lot uh, by, um, in, by the, our reproductive unit is the oral dehydrogen, which is called uh, Dufastin. This one does not really affect uh, the, it, it does not have an effect in terms of uh, myometrial contact, contractility, but in high dosages or concentration, it has been shown that this can stimulate my mitral contractility. So let's look at progesterone used in different phases. The first one, uh, we look at progesterone um, in terms of luteal support. This we're talking about in our patient who are undergoing ARTs. In ART, we know that usually this patient, they might have what we call luteal phase deficiency. So it's really necessary for this uh, patient during this period to supplement them with uh, progesterone because this is a critical phase where by giving progesterone, this enhance embryo implantation and it, there is a reduction in, uh, in terms of uh, miscarriages by giving this patient progesterone. And the patient who are actually even stimulated uh, the exogenous progesterone is actually highly recommended and it should be actually initiated a day after the oocyte retrieval. The dosages for this uh, natural micronized progesterone is actually quite higher than what we see um, when we see this patient during pregnancy. Uh, they are normally can be given a 600 milligram uh, of vaginal or oral Rectal, there's not much really data uh, to show the evidence or the benefit of a rectal uh, root of uh, this uh, macronized progesterone. And the range normally for this vaginal uh, progesterone, it can be around 400 to uh, 80 milligram per day, according to centers. Everyone is different in terms of how they give uh, progesterone to this patient. If they are giving the gel, which is... Um, 80% crinone, um, you can give that 90 milligram per day. Some groups also actually go quite higher by doubling the dose of that. And then the other forms also that we can give, if you're giving um, subcutaneous uh, progesterone, it can be the dose is 25. And if it's um, the IM 50 milligram per day, and then for the oral is uh, 30 uh, milligram or different uh, for this patient. 
And when is the ideal time to then start progesterone for luteal phase support? Timing is actually quite critical because if you start too soon, this leads to premature luteinization. And then those who start quite uh, late, there is also an increased risk of um, causing uterine contractility. So in artificial cycles, the onset of um, progesterone exposure really begins five days before blastocyst transfer in order to, synch to synchronize the endometrium so that they can properly uh, result in the implantation of the embryo. Some um, authors have actually have different views in terms of when to really then start. Cornell et al. suggested the window period, which is about a day before your site retrieval and also at least three days after uh, the beginning of um, the, the uh, uh, at least three days after the oocyte retrieval. Mohammed et al. has given also the optimal uh, period to start progesterone to say it should be at least a day after the oocyte retrieval. And then for this patient, when is an ideal time to stop? There's still also controversies regarding the optimal time to discontinue um, uh, uh, the progesterone for luteal phase support. It also this depends on the type of cycle that this patient has been given. In stimulated cycle, um, what most of the authors uh, evidence say, says the luteal surface, uh, phase support can be stopped as soon as the pregnancy test is positive. Some says if it's artificial cycles, because in artificial cycles, the luteal phase is really um, uh, there's a there's luteal uh, phase deficiency. They mentioned that uh, this patient can continue with progesterone up until eight to, to 10 weeks uh, um, of pregnancy. Some of these uh, authors also continue at least with their progesterone for up to 12 weeks of gestation. If the patient, because some of this patient might bleed during pregnancy, it's uh, best to continue with the progesterone um, in, 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 in the first trimester as some studies have shown that uh, in the, uh, the bleeding patient, uh, progesterone does have uh, an effect in, in terms of uh, preventing miscarriages. We're gonna look at some other cases that we normally uh, are faced with our patient. So what about the patient who have um, recurrent miscarriages? What is the role of progesterone? Early studies actually has shown that uh, progesterone uh, supplementations in this patient who present with recurrent miscarriages, it does improve some, um, some pregnancies. But you can see here, these are the studies that were done in 1983 and 1998. Subsequently, there has been a lot of studies that have been looking at progesterone. And in these studies, uh, even this, uh, the, the Cochrane reviews have looked at all a lot of these uh, studies by doing meta-analysis. They found that there is actually um, a little or no difference in terms of uh, life birth rate when giving uh, progesterone um, to this patient with uh, recurrent uh, miscarriages as compared to placebos. Also followed by this, the FIGO, they also did um, extensive studies in terms of looking at uh, patients presenting with uh, recurrent pregnancy uh, um, uh, losses uh, to see if there's any uh, um, um, benefit for that. From that, they concluded that there is insufficient evidence to recommend the use of progesterone to improve life birth rate in women who present with recurrent miscarriages. And the latest study that has been done from the ACOG, they looked at um, micronized uh, vaginal progesterone to prevent uh, miscarriages. And the biggest trials that have been conducted is the PROMIS trial and the PRISM trials. These studies uh, were mainly conducted in uh, 45, um, uh, with the PROMIS it was 45 hospitals in UK and also nine hospitals in Netherlands. Uh, they had about um, eight, 836 patients from their results they found that they, it, there is at least a 3% uh, greater life birth rate if you give this patient uh, progesterone as compared to placebos. The PRISM, which is the progesterone in spontaneous miscarriages trial, 
also was conducted in UK. It was in 48 hospitals. They had 4,153 patients. And from their results, there was also the same 3% greater life birth rate uh, with progesterone as compared to placebos. From their analysis, um, these this studies, uh, they went further to subclassify the groups uh, looking at the number of miscarriages to see if the patient has one miscarriage or more miscarriages, what is there any um, difference in terms of um, uh, life birth rates in the progesterone group versus uh, the placebo. For patients who had uh, one miscarriage or more and presenting also with bleeding in, uh, in this current pregnancy, the life birth rate was 70% with progesterone versus 70% uh, with uh, placebo. You can clearly see that from that, uh, the difference is not really um, much uh, or is not significant. Then they further also went further to look at the, the miscarriages. And then from the results, they found that the benefit was with patients who present with at least three or more previous miscarriages and history of current bleeding. The life rate was uh, at the rate of 72% with the progesterone group versus 57% uh, 50, uh, with the placebo. This was quite significant. Here, the conclusion around this difference, it might be mainly the patient who present with more miscarriages, like three, the defect might be really with the endometrial uh, lining. So the progesterone has been shown, at least if it's given to, in this patient, it might be really helping in terms of uh, supporting the endometrium. But the patient must also have to have a current uh, bleeding in the uh, pre pregnancy. And then what about um, progesterone um, in patient who present with threatened miscarriages? Um, the Crocrane also looked at uh, um, meta-analysis uh, in this patient, try to see if um, there is any um, effect by giving this patient progesterone. It was uh, a big trials here, and they were looking at all these different forms of progesterones. There was uh, vaginal micronized progesterone, also didrogesterone and also um, oral um, macronized uh, progesterone. And also the other was um, the IM progesterone. And then the last um, was uh, with the placebos. From these results, um, they actually um, find that uh, um, women who present with uh, um, threatened miscarriages um, vagin vaginal um, uh, micronized uh, progesterone and didrogesterone didn't really show any differences in terms of um, uh, life birth rate. But if the patient uh, have um, prevents, uh, 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 previous miscarriages and early bleeding, the uh, uh, life birth rate was actually increased uh, in the patient who are taking um, vaginal uh, micronized progesterone as compared uh, to the placebo. And what are the other um, bodies saying about the use of uh, progesterone in threatened miscarriages? The body that has talked a lot in terms of uh, progesterone uh, is also uh, the NICE guidelines. The NICE guidelines recommending offering um, our patient vaginal micronized progesterone 400 milligram twice daily to women who have an intrauterine pregnancy and a confirmed fetal heart who present with vaginal bleeding and a previous uh, miscarriage. And you have to uh, use um, the, the um, progesterone from at least 16 weeks and you can continue with the, uh, the progesterone up to 34 weeks of gestation. But the NICE does not recommend a progesterone in the following in women who have vaginal bleeding in early pregnancy without a previous history of miscarriage, and also in women who have, who have had one or more previous miscarriages, but no history of uh, early bleeding in the current uh, pregnancy. Um, the other group that we also see that we an encounter with our consultations is when we scan our patient, we might find the evidence of the short cervix, and then our patient doesn't even have any history of previous preterm deliveries. 
what about this patient? What are the, the guidelines says? And in terms of a short a cervix, it's been defined as a mid-trimester cervical length. By mid-trimester, we mean the cervix, cervical length that is taken between 18 to 24 weeks of gestation. So mid-trimester cervical length of for less than 25 millimeters with a single teen pregnancy and no previous history. So this is some of the group of patients that we see. Um, there was also a, a meta-analysis by Jad and groups. They looked at the different forms of uh, progesterone. It was also the vaginal, oral, the IM versus other interventions that we know that have been used uh, for prevention of preterm deliveries, which is at large and pessary, trying to see are this intervention uh, actually quite helpful in terms of preventing preterm birth in this singleton low risk patient? From their results, uh, the vaginal um, 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 micronized um, progesterone did have it showed uh, to have uh, to reduce uh, the preterm uh, delivery significantly for uh, for patient uh, before thirty four weeks. The odds ratio was 0 0.45, and the number needed to treat is actually 1 is to 7. Um, clearly, from here, we can really see that uh, um, for patients who present with a short cervix, progesterone um, has been, it shows that there is significant benefit. The same group, um, the other groups also that looked at uh, such patient is uh, the group from um, Romero in uh, 2018. Um, from their group also, they did um, meta-analysis. They also looked at uh, previous studies uh, from 2007 up to 2016, and they combined all these uh, groups. And then from their result from this forest plot, you can see that the relative risk is 0 0.62. There was a significant reduction in giving patient vaginal progesterone, those who present um, with um, a short cervix uh, uh, in, uh, if you follow this patient. And then the same group of this patient, um, if you give them progesterone, there was also positive um, outcomes in terms of the infant's outcome. The outcomes that they looked at is in neonatal ICU admission, respiratory distress syndrome, mechanical ventilation, neonatal morbidity and mortality, and even their birth weight less than 1.5. So all these outcomes were actually quite significant because uh, the p-value for all of these outcomes are actually um, quite significant at uh, less than 0 0.05. So by giving a patient a progesterone in this patient who present with the, in the mothers with short cervix, there is also benefit in terms of uh, neonatal outcomes. And what about uh, progesterone um, in just preventing preterm deliveries? Does uh, our vaginal progesterone prevent recurrent uh, preterm birth in women with a single teen gestation? There's a lot of also um, trials uh, that have been done. Um, they also looked at older studies, but from this, um, if they looked at uh, just uh, all the studies, and most of the studies were actually quite mixed. So from the studies, if they just look at all the studies, uh, they tend to come with the conclusion to say that uh, vaginal um, um, progesterone significantly reduces the risk of preterm um, birth uh, before 34 weeks, and the reduction is also quite significant. But when they went further, this analysis went further to look at the studies that had actually low risk of uh, bias. When they just concentrate only on the, the, those studies, the finding was that uh, vaginal uh, progesterone did not reduce the risk of preterm uh, birth for patient up to uh, for for deliveries up to 37 weeks because you can clearly see that uh, the relative risk for that is uh, 0 0.96, and even also for preterm deliveries uh, before 34 weeks, the relative risk was also sitting at uh, 0 0.90. So the studies that doesn't have low risk, uh, that has that has low risk bias with good uh, um, uh, uh, methodologies, they've shown that if you just give vaginal progesterone trying to prevent preterm deliveries, there is actually uh, no benefit in terms of that. 
Hence the final conclusion from most of their bodies. They've said that there is no convincing evidence to support the use of vaginal progesterone in women with a singleton gestation with just a history of uh, spontaneous uh, preterm deliveries. But they, you've got different bodies who come with their conclusions that also guide us in terms of deciding how do we go further in terms of managing this patient. The ACO guidelines in 2023, they've actually recommended against using vaginal progesterone just to um, prevent recurrent um, preterm deliveries in patients who do not have a short cervix. And then the Society of Maternal and Fetal Medicine in same year, they said, if the, even if this patient have a previous preterm delivery, you have to look um, at other factors that can help us decide if these uh, patients are gonna be benefiting from progesterone. So the factors that you need to consider is basically the gestational age of presentation of the previous spontaneous preterm birth, the use of progesterone in the previous pregnancy and the number of pre uh, previous spontaneous preterm deliveries and the number of term birth or any outcomes of a uh, recent pregnancies. If you see that the patient has um, uh, previous uh, preterm deliveries that are more, and even the gestational age where the patient delivered, if it's quite a uh, preterm, they consider adding such a factor, you can put that and recommend by giving this patient um, progesterone in uh, there. And then the other biggest challenges is patient who we see with a multiple pregnancy. What about this patient? Is there a role of progesterone? Um, Cochrane Review also um, looked at uh, progesterone um, in terms of uh, preventing spontaneous preterm birth in women who present with multiple pregnancies. Their conclusion was that women with uh, multiple pregnancy, the administration of progesterone, whether IM or vaginal, does not appear to be associated with a reduction in risk of preterm birth or any improved uh, neonatal outcomes. Further studies actually also followed um, in terms of uh, looking at also patient presenting uh, with multiple pregnancies. The latest being done um, uh, recently in 2017 and 2009 is the stop it and also this uh, pre uh, the, 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 the preterm birth prevention in twins where they looked also at various um, interventions just to see if uh, any intervention is, is it really helpful in terms of preventing preterm deliveries in twins. Their con conclusion from the BJOCT, they said that none of the intervention actually uh, significantly reduced the risk of preterm birth uh, overall. But there is a significant uh, reduction um, in, in terms of, uh, uh, by giving the progesterone, it actually um, prolonged yeah, um, the, the outcomes by a few weeks. And then if it does that, you get uh, better outcomes in terms of the neonatal outcomes, mainly for patients. There was a significant reduction in a very low birth weight of uh, less than 1.5 kg. And even um, mechanical ventilation, there was a significant reduction as the re relative risk is sitting at uh, 0 0.61. The stop it uh, randomized trial also uh, concluded to say that uh, progesterone does not prevent any preterm birth in women with twin pregnancy. The OS ratio was quite high at 1.16. The last trials that also uh, looked at um, vaginal progesterone or the systemic uh, reviews that looks at uh, uh, vaginal progesterone for preventing preterm birth and adverse perinatal outcome um, was done in ACOG. From this trial, also according to the trial, vaginal progesterone does not prevent preterm birth or does it improve perinatal outcome in unselected twin gestation, but it appears to reduce the risk of preterm birth occurring at early gestation in twins with a sonographic uh, short cervix. What about other indications? Um, we know that uh, we've got patients who are at risk of um, spontaneous preterm 
birth because of uh, their histories or previous operations that have been done. Looking at those uh, is patient who had a previous lens or patient who normally present with uh, uterine anomalies like uterine septate or bioconic uterus. From this also, the evidence uh, really has shown that there is no evidence that the use of progesterone in is beneficial in reducing uh, the risk of uh, spontaneous preterm uh, birth in the absence of uh, cervical shortenings. If there's cervical shortenings, by giving progesterone, the benefit has been reported there. What about the safety of uh, progesterone? Um, some studies have also looked at the safety profile for progesterone, and they looked at this patient, I mean, the, the offsprings um, up to two years. From that, there was no adverse uh, effect in terms of the neurodevelopmental outcomes, and there was actually um, no significant differences in terms of the risk of congenital uh, abnormalities. From this, it really looks uh, like uh, progesterone is really quite a safe drug, but we need really to have a clear and proper indications for giving our patient uh, progesterones. We've got different formulations and dosages uh, for progesterone. And uh, the um, one that has been advocated by a lot of um, bodies is vaginal uh, micronized progesterone. It appears to be more effective, you know, as compared to other forms of progesterone. There are some also relative contraindications that you need to take into account when giving our patient uh, progesterones. Those who are allergic to soy or peanuts, a previous history of thromboembolism, and even patients who present with uh, liver diseases. The dosage that has been recommended um, for vaginal progesterone, we've got uh, the gel, uh, which is crinone, 8% um, at 90 milligram. There are also vaginal preparations that you can give as 200 milligram daily. But when looking at the uh, different trials that looked at the dosages and to show if there were any effect, those who give 100 milligram daily of uh, progesterone the studies did not show any benefit in terms of uh, prevention of preterm birth, but those who were given um, um, 200 milligram daily of progesterone, and they showed that uh, actually um, there is benefit, uh, then they was effective in terms of response. And Romero et al. also in terms of twins have shown that if you give uh, 400 milligram in, in twins, uh, it's actually quite effective. And then for that, you can divide the dosages, uh, uh, BD, decide to give it in the morning and evening. And then time to give progesterone that has been shown to be convenient and effective, it's um, at night. And then what about the durations? Also, there's also controversies uh, regarding the dosages. Um, but most people advocate giving progesterone between 16 to, 20 weeks, to 24 weeks of gestation especially in those patients who had a previous uh, preterm birth with also a short cervix. And you can continue with progesterone up to 34 or 36 weeks of gestation. And here we're just showing the different forms of progesterone. And then you can see also the cost uh, for progesterone. Just the 15 tablets of crinone is around 800. And eutrogestin, 15 tablets is the... Uh, uh, around 300, and the cytologist uh, is uh, also 15 tablets, is around uh, 400. Then, what do guidelines um, recommend? Um, looking at a few guide, like, uh, bodies, uh, the NICE, they recommend uh, progesterone to be offered to women who experience bleeding, um, patient with a uh, uh, who present with previous bleeding um, in the current pregnancy and who also had a previous miscarriage. They also recommend giving um, vaginal progesterone to women who present um, with a short cervix and who had also a previous preterm birth. The EJRE also um, recommends uh, vaginal progesterone, especially for women who present uh, with three or more miscarriages or pregnancy losses. FIGO, um, they recommend giving uh, progesterone for women who are at high risk of uh, uh, preterm birth and also patients who present with a spontaneous preterm birth 
with also sonographic um, um, evidence of short cervix. The South African um, um, guidelines uh, looking at our, what our Department of Health says, they also recommend the use of vaginal progesterone, uh, which is uh, 20 milligram daily uh, until 34 weeks for women who are at high risk of preterm um, labor, uh, especially if they present with a single term pregnancy. The SASOC also, um, also recommend using vaginal micronized progesterone for women with singleton pregnancies with a history of spontaneous preterm birth and also a current cervical length of less than 25 millimeters. Um, the last body's um, figure does not um, uh, support just to routinely give patient uh, progesterone, you know, trying to see if it's, because it's not beneficial um, in first trimester in patient uh, who present uh, with uh, recurrent miscarriages. And also ACOG does not recommend using vaginal progesterone um, in patient who had a previous preterm birth uh, with inpatient uh, without um, uh, evidence of uh, short cervix. So in conclusion, um, I think by looking at all these different bodies, what we can uh, gather from this, I think most of the bodies, they really then recommend vaginal uh, macronized uh, progesterone for women who present with a singleton or even twins, uh, but there must be a presence of some sort of uh, risk factor like short cervix. So as it's been shown that by some of the evidence, even if the reduction is less in some of the randomized control that we have seen, but they, it shows that progesterone in such subset of patient, it does reduce the risk of spontaneous preterm birth and also it improves uh, postnatal outcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mulukwane. We, I'm sure we'll have time to engage with you on all of that. Thank you. Our next speaker and the last speaker is Dr. Quentin Blacknot. Dr. Blacknot is a certified Eurogyne and is a consultant at Doranginza slash Nelson Mandela Medical School or University and is running our Eurogyne clinic at Doranginza Hospital. Over to you, Quentin. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Mabenge, and also thanks to SASOC for the opportunity uh, to come and do this presentation today. Um, the last time I spoke, I was given a very dry topic called amenorrhea, and today I'm um, assigned a very wet-ish topic called uh, stress urinary incontinence. Um, yeah, I just want to say right from the beginning, all the textbooks and all the literature say that um, Urogynecological pathologies are not life-threatening, which of course is mostly true. However, that is only if you believe that life is only a physical thing. Um, these conditions are quite debilitating to our patients. Um, they withdraw from society, churches, shopping, um, family gatherings, etc. So in terms of psychosocial issues, it is actually, I, I think, a little bit of a life-threatening condition. I um, also want to say about stress urinary continence, unlike our overactive bladder and urge incontinences, which is largely um, managed pharmacologically, uh, these are very much mechanical issues. So we will also touch um, briefly on, um, as you will see later, the, the continence mechanisms. Okay, so that is just the outline of uh, my talk. I'm going to quickly look at the International Continent Society definition of genuine stress urinary incontinence. Um, potential risk factors, um, 
And as I mentioned now, if in, for us to understand the management of stress incontinence, we absolutely have to understand the continence me mechanisms and what goes wrong. Um, and that, that leads to the incontinence theories, and there are quite a lot of them. And then we will briefly, in the five minutes allocated to me, look at conservative management, which I think we often um, neglect, the surgical management, and then just a few of the other strategies, probably used mostly by the um, the urology team. Okay, so International Continental Society, as you know, they put out a document um, which is called the terminology document where there's definitions for everything from frequency to urge to nocturia, et cetera. And currently they say that um, stress urinary incontinence is merely the complaint of involuntary loss of urine of effort physical exertion, including sporting activities um, and things like sneezing and coughing. Now, stress urinary incontinence is fairly easy to diagnose. Um, as we know, it's, it's, it's a history. The patient will come in and she will tell you that whenever I do any of those things, um, I wet myself a little bit. Um, but of course, if you are interested, you can do urodynamics, of which this is an example. And you'll note there, whenever the patient is asked to cough, Right at the bottom, there is a leak. Um, you can also do translabial, transperineal ultrasounds if you are really interested to know if it is a hypermobile urethra that you're dealing with. And of course, there's also advanced urodynamics, urethral profiles, if you want to really know if it is related to intrinsic sphincter dysfunction, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, so I call this potential risk factors for one reason, that many of the studies looking at these things are a little bit anecdotal. Um, some of them are quite low powered. And a lot of these things relate not only to stress incontinence, but to prolapse as well. So as we know, in urogyne, prolapse and incontinence often goes hand in hand. Um, so what about age? Um, so the age distribution for incontinence of all causes um, is very widely reported in studies like the EPINCON study um, that we are all familiar with. Um, I'm saying all familiar with, and then I look at the registrar's faces. Um, it depicts a steady increase in moderate to severe incontinence throughout the um, adult lifespan, but there is definitely a distinct peak in, in incontinence around the time of menopause, and we'll probably see later how that relates to estrogen. In terms of obesity, um, this is perhaps the most clearly established risk factor um, for incontinence in women, and there is a typical pattern of association, again, that we see in very large studies like the Nurses' Health Study. Um, parity, pregnancy, and mode of delivery. These effects are very strong, of course, as expected in the third and the fourth decades of life, but there is a substantial attenuation or a decrease um, throughout the middle age, so that by the time the patient is older, usually quoted as 65, um, there's no persistent effect related to the parity and the pregnancy, but rather other risk factors then, um, tend to dominate. Um, in terms of um, the menopause ball replacement therapy, um, as we had touched on earlier by the previous speaker, um, while there's current evidence um, continues to support prescribing topical, um, not systemic, but topical estrogen, the nurse's health study, again, the HER study, the Women's Health Initiative study, all provide strong evidence that oral estrogens um, with or without combined progesterones actually is associated with an increased risk. Um, so it is okay to use it topically, but not systemically. Um, in terms of hysterectomy, many women date the onset of the incontinence to a um, advent of hysterectomy. Um, but most of these studies are uncontrolled case series. They're small randomized trials. And many of them have also pr produced quite conflicting results. Um, there is, although, however, evidence from large population-based studies, which there's a causal link, um, but the pathophysiological mechanisms are quite poorly understood still. Um, I think in terms of diet, the most comprehensive assessment came from the Lester um, MRC study, the family study, um, and it found an increase in incidence of stress urine incontinence um, as well as urge incontinence with the intake of things like carbonated drinks and caffeine. Overall, this lack of consistency in the reports of dietary associations with incontinence. 
and that most likely reflects the methods the method methods used in the studies in terms of socioeconomic status um, it is strongly correlated with um, risk factors for incontinence however um, there are other issues such as parity bmi diabetes depression smoking and timing of menopause um, and of course the higher the socioeconomic status the more likely the patient is um, um, going to be to seek help for the for the incontinence without smoking data from observational studies on smoking is again quite inconsistent uh, again in the Leicester family study uh, current smoking uh, is associated with an increased risk of um, urinary stress incontinence um, exercise again it, we are quite clear that high impact exercises such as gymnastics or trampolining leads to stress urinary incontinence. Um, and then evidence from longitudinal studies suggest also that exercise actually have a protective effect against incident urinary incontinence. But again, this is probably mediated by the effect on the weight um, when the patient exercises. And all these other comorbidities, diabetes, um, persistent UTIs, cognitive impairments, ischemic heart disease, um, physical impairments and depression or um, are related with incontinence um, in some way or another. Um, but these different comorbidities um, have been confirmed in, in, in univariate analyses. What about ethnic variation? Um, it is said that environmental and cultural difference in different race groups rather than genetic differences may explain the differences in prevalence between populations and the most consistent transfers uh, contrast is in the rates of stress incontinence for black and white women. So in most of the studies, black women have half the prevalence of stress urinary incontinence as compared to white women. Um, and with these differences persisting after adjustment for age, for parity and for BMI. Okay, so as I said before, I don't really think we can manage stress urine incontinence without first looking at the continence mechanisms. So for the female, and uh, specifically for the female continence mechanism, does depend on the intrinsic properties of the urethra. It depends on the sphincter, as well as the anatomic support um, surrounding these tissues. Coaptation of the mucosa and compression of the lumen can both contribute to sealing or to closure of the urethra. Um, as we know, the mucosa has many folds in it, and it is thought that these mucosal secretions actually increase surface tension and thereby allowing the urethra to seal. Um, under the mucosa, there is a very vascular submucosa layer, and that also exerts some compressive, compressive effects on the mucosa. Um, and these actually have estrogen receptors and a lack of estrogen may then therefore contribute to stress urine incontinence through decreased vascularity in this area. Of course, there's muscular compression, which is provided by circular smooth muscle throughout the urethra. The external sphincter itself is composed of striated circular muscle fibers, and they are the thickest in the middle part of the urethra. There are two types of these striated fibers, the slow twitch fibers. They provide a continuous tone that keeps the urethra closed. And then you have your fast twitch fibers. They respond to voluntary and reflex stimuli, such as a sudden increase in contraction at the time of abdominal pressure or voluntary attempts to prevent incontinence. Um, then in addition to that, there's also two extrinsic striated muscles called the compressor urethrae and the urethro vaginal sphincter that um, contribute to the continents. This is just a picture of basically everything I said now, as you can see there, um, the urethra and the bladder and neck gets um, fibers from different muscles, and then also the mucosa and the submucosa layer. Then in terms of um, pathogenesis, um, <laughs> these are well-known theories. Of course, the integral theory attempts to combine or to assimilate what is known about the pelvic floor support and apply that to incontinence. The integral theory basically states that the pelvic organ prolapse and its associated incontinence um, are caused by connective tissue laxity in the vagina and the supporting ligaments. So it basically says that the vagina forms sort of a hammock and 
um, it is supported by three different mechanisms. First of all, you have the anterior pubococcygeous muscle, which lifts the uh, anterior vaginal wall. And then you have the bladder neck, which is closed by downward contraction or traction. And then finally, the pelvic floor muscles draws the sort of hammock upwards, and all of that causes compression of the urethra. So if the system of support is then disrupted by laxity, as in the integral theory, um, then um, incontinence will ensue. Um, and in this system also, the mid-urethra contains the main continence mechanism, and that then leads to the concept, concept of a mid-urethral sling, as we shall see later, um, as an operation um, called the TVT, or the tension-free tape. Um, then in 1994, Delance, the guy that came up with the uh, levels of support of the vagina, proposed the hammock theory. Um, he felt that continence depend on tran efficient transmission of pressure to the bladder neck um, and to the ure urethra, but against a rigid support of the pubocervical fascia and the anterior vaginal wall. Um, basically, the difference between these two theories is that the integral theory is um, play, posits more of an active role in the pelvic musculature, while the integral theory also considers more urging continence. The hammock theory focuses more on stress urinary incontinence. Um, and just to help us understand a little bit, if you consider the white uh, is the pubic bone and the other white part at the back is the bladder, um, and the yellow is actually the displacement that takes place. So that would be the normal support of the bladder, neck, and urethra. You'll notice the angle is normal, and you'll also notice that it does not descend below the inferior margin um, of the pubis. Um, and then, um, as I said before, there are, there are quite a lot of um, authors and researchers who came up with these theories. Um, we are familiar with Bonnie, Delancey, Maguire, um, Kelly, all of these guys came up with different theories and developed the different theories. And uh, most recently, Blavet came up with a classification of the different types of stress incontinence. I'm sure many of us didn't know that stress incontinence is also classified. Um, so this is a type zero stress incontinence. You'll notice that the vesicle neck is closed. At rest, it is situated above the inferior margin of the symphysis pubis. But during stress, the vesicle neck and the proximal urethra open, and there's a rotational descent. Uh, this is very characteristic of a cystourethral seal. However, there's no incontinence, um, despite the fact that the patient complains that she feels like she's leaking. Um, this is a type 1 stress urinary incontinence. You'll notice that during stress, the vesicle neck and the proximal urethra open, and but it descends less than 2 centimeters, um, and the urinary incontinence is only apparent during periods of increased abdominal pressure. There is little, there's no cystocele associated with it. Um, this is a type 2 stress incontinence. During stress, uh, in the vesicle neck and the proximal urethra again opens, but there is a rotational descent characteristic of a cystourethral seal, and incontinence is very apparent during periods of increased intra-abdominal pressure. Um, in a type 3 stress urinary incontinence, um, the vesicle neck and the proximal urethra actually open at rest um, in the absence of the trissal contraction. So the proximal urethra no longer functions as a sphincter here. There's obvious leakage, um, which may be gravitational in nature, and it's associated with minimal increase in the intravascular pressure. Um, so the concept of ISD, intrinsic sphincter defunction, over time, the type 3 um, stress urine contents evolved into this concept of intrinsic sphincter dysfunction, which basically notes an intrinsic malfunction of the urethral sphincter um, itself. And then we have the concept of a hypermobile urethra, which by definition is really 30 degree displacement of the urethra. This is one example where there's a downward descent of the bladder base this time, the and, and the urethra during the cough. The urethra, as you can see, it widens and shortens, and then incontinence ensues. Um, this is another example of a urethral hypermobility with incontinence. Here, the downward descent of the bladder base and urethra during the cough. The posterior wall of the urethra, however, um, moves more than the anterior wall, and it actually pulls the urethra open, and then incontinence um, ensues. I hope that is very clear to everyone because you need to understand it if you're going to understand how we're going to fix this problem um, or the mechanics of it. 
So how do we actually manage stress urinary incontinence? Well, as with most medical conditions, there is conservative management. There is um, very little medical management, however, in this case. And then um, we, we basically rely on surgical management. And I just sort of put everything together there because there are hundreds of operations, um, maybe not hundreds, but close to hundreds. Um, and these consist of retropubic or transvaginal suspensions, um, the different kinds of slings that we get, um, autologous slings, partial slings, and then more recently, your mid-urethral slings. Um, the pubovaginal slings are basically placed at the neck of the bladder, whereas the mid-urethral slings, as we heard earlier, is in the middle of the urethra where the continence mechanism is actually located. And then also more recently, your transurethral injectables. So I'll just briefly, briefly look at all of them. We are all familiar with most of them. And then I thought I'll just look at some of the other things mostly used by urologists, I suppose. Um, radiofrequency ablation, RT Swissel sphincters, lasers, and stem cell technologies, and see where we are um, with those ones. Um, yeah. Okay, so in terms of conservative management of stress incontinence, we looked at all the risk factors just now for a reason. Um, chronic cough is one of them, of course. And the urogynecologist may need to refer the patient to the appropriate ENT surgeon, respiratory physician, or gastroenterologist. Certainly no woman who has a persistent cough that is not treated should be given continence surgery, because if you do that, then the surgery won't last, and it'll actually, the incontinence will just resume post-operatively if you don't um, address the, the cough as well. Um, what about obesity? A large randomized control trial showed that women who lost at least 10% of their uh, body weight, um, this sounds very similar to the, the PICOS story, um, they were significant. They, they actually reduced their incontinence by at least 70%, 70 um, in the frequency of their incontinence. I put metformin there because there is a, a trial on metformin, as you see at the bottom where they look specifically at women with trunkal obesity, which we know is characteristic of um, diabetes because of pressure, downward pressure on the bladder. And then another meta-analysis of 33 cohort studies found that bariatric surgery for women with uh, BMI more than 35 um, resulted in complete resolution of incontinence in 48% of patients, so, and that was about 2,900 patients. Um, as we mentioned before, the role of estrogen, uh, because there's estrogen receptors in the submucosa and the mucosa, um, estrogen therapy should give benefit theoretically. Um, this is by thickening the urethral epithelium, by improving the mucosal coaptation and enhancing the vascular tone in the periurethral uh, vessels. The Cochrane meta-analysis on the use of estrogens for incontinence in 2002 concluded that topical estrogens, again, not systemic, but topical estrogens, has a 50% benefit for incontinence compared to 25% for a placebo. And then a recent Cochrane review concluded that the vaginal estrogen um, was associated with significant increase in the strength of the urethral closure pressure, pressure with a relative risk of um, 4.3. 4 um, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to mention a little bit more about uh, physiotherapy. Physiotherapy actually starts in the office when you first assess the patient, when you do your vaginal examination and you ask the patient, um, or you assess the tone of the patient, make sure that the patient can actually contract the pelvic muscles and not the gluteal muscles and not the abdominal muscles. Um, so that's where the first um, sort of physiotherapy starts. However, most of us don't have enough time to to start and to continue with an intense physio um, program. And that is why I mentioned specifically um, home-based pelvic floor training programs, office-based programs, as well as the use of a nurse continence advisor. Now, a study in patients with mild to moderate incontinence um, showed that for those with mild, improved by 65% and those with moderate by 35%, um, improve and or cure rates um, of those receiving office physiotherapy. Um, a Cochrane review also concluded that women with stress incontinence who underwent a supervised pelvic floor training program are eight times more likely to report cure um, than those who do it at home. 
percent versus six percent with a, a relative risk of eight um, for those who had no treatment or a sham treatment. Um, what does the physiotherapist actually do? We just send them there and we hope they will improve. Um, but they, they, they do quite a lot of things. First of all, the physiotherapist is there to act as a personal trainer. They um, aim to re-examine the pelvic floor muscles as the, at regular intervals as, the, um, as the, the, the program continues. They're also there to evaluate the bladder chart that you will give the patient um, to see regularly so that the patient understands it. They are there to increase motivation because, as I mentioned earlier, it's not life-threatening, but it can be quite debilitating. So they um, give positive feedback by various methods, verbal feedback, biofeedback methods, etc. They use things like um, graded perineometers that measure muscle contraction. They use things like, like weighted cones um, for 20 minutes twice a day. And they use electrostimulation therapy as well when there's a weak or absent pelvic floor muscle contraction. Um, and then uh, some of the studies show that women who were given biofeedback had a significantly greater likelihood of cure or improvement in the, in the continence. Um, the International Consultation on Incontinence also found that um, the use of the ESTEM, the electrostimulation, um, gave cure rates of about 22% versus 5% for those who had no electrostimulation. Um, so they did significantly better. And then um, I'm mentioning the chair. We've seen the chair, most of us, at most of the recent congresses. And um, there was, I think all of us were asked to test the chair. You sit on the chair, you don't have to undress. There's an electromagnetic field that comes from underneath the chair. Um, and uh, that is being used by the physios now. So a recent randomized control trial using a, a sham chair versus this chair in women um, who are unable to contract the muscles actually found that there was a, a significant reduction in the leakage when they used it uh, on uh, the chair using a PET uh, test compared to those who use the, the sham chair. So if you have some money, maybe you can invest in one of those chairs for the home or for the office. I'm not sure. Yeah. OK. Uh, what do we do if conservative therapy fails, but the patient does not actually want surgery? Well, before the 1990s, such patients would have had no choice but to use continence pads. Um, however, in the last few decades, several bioengineering companies have taken up the challenge and they developed various devices um, to correct the incontinence. And these are just some of the examples. Um, there was something called an intral device. It was shaped like a prolapse ring, as you can see, a pessary. Um, the one on the right there, it had two prongs, however, on either side of the urethra, and it actually cradled um, the urethra. It was, however, expensive. Gynecologists found it difficult to fit, and so it was actually discontinued. Um, um, although the clinical trials that time indicated a 60% um, improvement. And then because it was discontinued, the same inventor, not long after that, came up with something which was like a hollow tampon called a contiform device. And again, this was um, giving a cure rate of only about, or improving a rate of only about 22%. And then um, the continence dish at the bottom there, um, which we are a little bit familiar with, looks like a prolapse ring, but it has a small knob which fits under the urethra uh, to support the urethra. Um, then in terms of drugs, I just put a question mark next to the loxetine. The loxetine is a drug that was developed for incontinence because, as I said earlier, it's mostly not pharmacological. Um, it is a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, and the registrars will be able to tell me that it has an effect on the nucleus of ONUF in the pelvic nerve plexus. Um, it, as I said, it was designed for the medical treatment of stress incontinence. However, it has very uh, bad side effect of quite bad nausea and vomiting, around 14 to 20%. So it did not have very great um, success. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about lasers again later. Um, but um, all I want to say is this is a statement from the International Consultation on Incontinence again, that at this time, laser therapy is not recommended for the treatment of female stress incontinence in a clinical setting. What they need or what they want is studies to correct deficiencies regarding the mechanism of action of lasers, um, the long-term cure rates, 
as well as um, clarity on the adverse events before they can recommend it outside of clinical trials. Um, there have been, however, a few trials ready because lasers have been used and are being used um, over the last few years, um, and there's considerable interest in that. Um, and it is thought to work by increasing the collagen formation in the lamina propria of the periurethral area. Um, there is a randomized control study of 72 women from Brazil where they compared la the di carbon dioxide laser to promestrine together with a vaginal lubricant, and they found there was no difference in the outcome on the ICI questionnaire scores. And then in 2018, Song also did a study. Um, in Sorry, I, I'm going to come to that now. Song also did a study um, on an erbium laser, and again, he showed no significant difference from the baseline. So lasers are still under investigation, I believe. Okay, so after conservative management, we move on to um, the surgical management of the patient. I think I'm a bit, yeah. Um, some of these things are quite historical. I'm just going to mention them quickly to see where we have come from and where we are quite at the moment, as Dr. Chumina said earlier, um, then, now, and beyond. Um, sounds like that TV movie. Um, so, Bladder neck buttress is no longer a primary procedure for urinary stress incontinence, um, but it is still used in highly selective cases of mild urinary stress incontinence. Um, and as I try to demonstrate there, the sutures are actually um, passed deeply through the periurethral endopelvic fascia on either side of the urethra and then um, sutured onto the posterior aspect of the symphysis pubis. This procedure was first described by Kelly. So we talk about the Kelly placation in 1913 and the Kelly reported an initial subjective success rate of 90%. But after five year follow up, the success rate was actually decreased to only 60%. Um, yeah. And then we have the very well known, probably the first and most well known operation for stress incontinence, the open birch corpus suspension. Um, where we place, we go abdominally and we go into the space of retzius, uh, retropubic space, and we place three ethibon sutures on either side of the urethrovesical junction, which we identify by a catheter in the bladder. Um, each of these sutures are then attached to the iliopectineal or the corpus ligament at the back of the pubic bone. And um, the surgeon with his assistant then puts his hand in the vagina to lift up the bladder neck and um, also this dictates the degree of tension so that you don't overcorrect. Um, and this is the one that I did. Mm, there we go. Um, this is a Birch's open corpus suspension. Um, I did say I did it just for the registrars. Um, so from 1970 to the late 1990s, of course, this was the most common procedure for stress incontinence. Um, it was designed by Birch gynecologists and it was really designed to treat filled bladder neck buttress. It remains very effective procedure today. And if the patient requires abdominal operation for any reason, also with the controversy surrounding mesh and slings and things that's currently with us, um, some people are going back to birch corpus suspension now again. It is mainly indicated, as I said, for stress incontinence in the presence of urethral hypermobility on physical exam or on ultrasound. Um, or if there's obvious bladder neck descent or funneling on the ultrasound. Um, however, if the patient had previous surgery and you find that the urethra is quite fixed and non-mobile, then you should give rather consideration to a pubo vaginal sling or to one of the bulking agents. So it's really for a hypermobile urethra. Okay. Um, we are going to enter the space of retzius, the, the retropubic space, so the complications should be very obvious immediately. Um, there can be hemorrhage into the space with the patient, about half of the patients needing transfusion, half percent. Um, obviously, there can be trauma to the bladder with inadvertently um, putting the troca into the, the, the bladder. And that also means that you require them to do a cystoscope after the procedure to make sure you have not entered the bladder. Um, but um, that is sort of easily repaired, as you can see there. Um, I'm Prof will agree with me, um, operating on the bladder is... Sometimes easy, but sometimes not. Um, but that can happen in about 2% of the cases. And then in the long term, there is the trusa overactivity. 
um, which can be quite significant, and you have to counsel the patient about this. Um, remember that stress incontinence you can control to some degree. You don't jump, you don't sneeze, you don't cough, you don't laugh. Overactive bladder comes any time, so the patient cannot actually control it. So that would be worse for the patient. And then, of course, if you put the, the, make everything too tight, then there can be voiding difficulties in 2 to 5%. For the same reason, anterior and rectal seal formation, and also um, infections. Okay. And about laparoscopic corpus suspension, I think Dr. Glover said earlier that open operations should be buried, and there's already obituaries out for it. So um, we are moving to minimal invasive surgery. Um, however, the overall objective cure rate um, at 18 months for the laparoscopic corpus suspension was found to be lower than for the open suspension, 0.9. And when they, after 18 months, when they stretched it to five months, they find it was actually much lower, which is to us that the open procedure in terms of cure and improvement is better than the laparoscopic procedure. Um, and those are the, the studies that looked at those there. Um, yeah. Okay, so these again are just some of the recommendations from the ICI, which is the International Consultation of, um, of Incontinence, they put out a very extensive, very big document called Incontinence. So you can Google that document. So I just tried to summarize some of the major points. The open birch transport suspension can be recommended as an effective treatment for primary stress incontinence and has a long, uh, longevity. Uh, the laparoscopic corpus suspension, as we showed, shows comparable outcome to open in the short term but however, in the longer term, it seems to be not as effective as the open one. Um, and then the laparoscopic one should be recommended to those surgeons that are, have appropriate training and expertise in doing minimal invasion surgery that is sort of um, speaks for itself. But women should be advised in about the limited evidence available of long-term durability of laparoscopic um, corporal suspension. Okay. Then we move on to the pubal vaginal sling, um, and specifically I'm talking here about autologous fascial slings. Um, we know we use the one from the rectus sheath, but it's also the fascia lata. Um, this is also known as an abdominal vaginal sling. The procedure is a time-honored operation for patients with previous failed incontinence uh, or failed continence surgery. Um, this one was designed by urologists partly because they were more accustomed to abdominal approach to surgery. Um, in, again, still in the urological literature, it says that it's a primary procedure. I think most of the urogynecologists will disagree with that. Um, it is, however, useful in cases of previous failed incontinence surgery, when the urethra is fixed, as I mentioned before, in the retropubic space um, on the vaginal exam or the VCU, and also when the urethral closure pressure is low, below 20 centimeters of water. Um, um, yeah, and in those cases, you would rather use the sling or the, the bulking agent. Um, and then a recent ICI review revealed that uh, the fascial sling's objective cure rate was between 73 and 95%. Um, so basically, just in summary, you have a strip of um, fascia, which is about 13 by 2 centimeters, um, size of a kind of steel incision. Um, and then that is then placed under the urethra. Um, and then attached to the rectus abdominis um, under minimal tension. That's the pubo vaginal sling. Okay. Um, I just wanted to mention some of these historical ones. These are all sort of pubo vaginal slings that have been used in the past. Starting in 1973, Stamey described a procedure where he used a specific needle um, to thread um, a sling underneath the urethra, and attached to that was an arterial graft pleasure, so a piece of an artery. Um, and then Reyes, Perea, and Gittis modified that without using the arterial pleasure. Okay. Um, and then in 2000, the urologist from Wales suggested that we can use the fascial sling, but it doesn't have to be 13 centimeters long. So then it was more, more suture than sling, and that was called a sling on a string. And again, with a, the problem of um, synthetic meshes and things like that around. It's maybe something that is worthwhile to discuss with a patient, small piece of, a smaller piece of fascia. Okay, and then I mentioned the paravaginal repair, which I think most of us will not do for a simple cystocele. It's meant for both cystocele and uh, stress incontinence, so cystocele with stress incontinence. 
but to do an abdominal procedure um, just for a simple cystocene, I think is a little bit radical anyway. Okay. So I just wanted to show you an example of this is the stamy needle on this side here. And that's uh, three year, after three years when the when the sling with the arterial pigeon was actually removed from the patient. Okay. And now we are where we are now, and that is the slings that we currently use today for the TVT and the TOT. Um, so the tension-free vaginal tape was developed in the 1990s, as I said, and um, first published by um Umstein, and they claimed a 93% cure rate um, after three years. And as I mentioned before, you have to go into the retropubic space again. And because of that, there's the worry about vascular injury and bladder perforation. So the Lomi then introduced the transobturated tape so the transobturator tape avoids the retropubic space. It's sort of, instead of U-shaped, it's more like the C-shape from the, between the obturator for almonds. Okay. Um, the picture on top there is a PVT kit um, with uh, trocar and the guide wires and everything. Um, most of us have seen it and most of us have used it. And then the picture at the bottom shows you exactly how it loops underneath the urethra and then um, up through the um, in the pubis area. So that's tension-free vaginal tape. Um, and as I mentioned before, it has a cure rate of 93% claimed. Um, again, because we are entering the retropubic space, there are obvious risk factors for the TVT. Uh, as I mentioned, you have to do a cystoscopy, um, perforation of the bladder in 4 to 6%, the true selectivity 5 to 6%, UTIs. Um, again, if there's a vessel injury, that can be a hematoma. There's definitely voiding difficulties in the short and long term, which you may have to manage with um, suprapubic catheter. And then, of course, as we know, it's a synthetic tape, so exposure extrusion is a possibility, um, which can then lead to this chronic pain. And then there's other bowel injuries and vessel injuries and urethral penetrations, which are quite rare, as you can see. Um, what about the transobturator tape? As I said, in 2001, the Lomi then introduced the transobturator tape. It had a spiral needle, which penetrates the upper margin of the obturator foramen. Um, and it is passed to the supra suburethral space. And that was called an outside approach, outside in approach. So you come from the outside and to the middle of the vagina. Um, De Laval then modified that procedure in 2003 and called it the, the inside-out technique from the inside of the vagina to the outside. Um, and the, the inner aspect of the obturator forum is penetrated within the vagina and the tape emerges lateral near the origin of the adductor brevis muscle, which would also explain to us the complication of the TOT. Um, just to show you the difference between the two there, the first one is the retropubic one, as you can see where the troca is going. And then the other one is, as you can see, from the outside through the obturator foramen and into the vagina. So that's basically the difference between the two. Um, now, there have been many, many um, studies comparing Birch's corpus suspension, TVT, and TOT. Okay. Um, Araco at L performed a, a randomized, a stratified randomization between mild and severe incontinence showed a 100% cure rate for the TVT and only 66% for the transobturator tape. Sherlitz uh, and et al. also performed a study on patients with low mid urethral closure pressure. Um, and they found that the ones using the TOT actually required 20% reoperation versus only 1% for those with a TVT. So they then suggested that you first do the urodynamics, the mid urethral closure pressure, before you decide which one of the two slings to use. And then in 2017, the Cochrane Review, um, TVT versus TOT by Ford et al. found a very much higher risk of groin, groin pain in the transobturator um, procedure. These are, again, just some of the recommendations from the ICI. The retropubic sling has demonstrated equal or superior efficacy compared to other procedures. The retropubic sling is at least as effective as open corpus suspension in the short and medium term, but we're not sure about the long term. And then the rate of complications of the retropubic and the corpus suspension are similar, with both in the retropubic space. Um, but there are specific complications, such as bladder perforation, um, between differences between the, the different procedures. 
Um, overall, the retropubic sling um, uh, procedures perform equally in the short term, again, between 6 and 12 months. But in the longer term, um, this repeat surgery is more likely for the trans obturate to take. And then again, the rate, the rate of bladder rupture, post-op avoiding dysfunction and hematoma formation is lower in the TOT, but the groin pain is a problem. Okay. Right. What about mesh complications? Um, we know that we're dealing with a synthetic mesh again. So the recent NICE guidelines on the management of female incontinence no longer recommends the trans sling for first-line therapy in SUI. And one of the reasons is that um, the, the, the trans tape has a higher rate of mesh exposure than the retropubic um, sling. Um, and that was done in the ESTA study. And then the Thomas trial by Brubaker in 2011 also showed 4.7% of women experienced mesh complication with the slings. And in 2021, um, but Grace had all showed that um, they, um, they had 13 studies regarding methylethyl slings, and they found exposure rates very wide from 0.2% to 17%, but the overall risk is said to be 1.9% of uh, mesh exposure or mesh extrusion. Um, and the follow-up of these month, these uh, studies were between 12 and 84 um, months. Um, Okay, and then uh, I just wanted to mention the mini slings. We use quite a lot of mini slings, uh, maybe altars in our unit. And anecdotally, it's got a success rate of almost 100%. Um, and I'm saying anecdotally, we are one of the registrars is deciding to do a trial on that. Um, but I came across these two studies, um, Abdel Fattah, first of all. Um, they looked at mini slings and said, unfortunately, in their systemic review of nine studies, the mini slings. Um, showed a much higher failure rate with a relative risk of repeat surgery of 6.7%. And then a Cochrane review in 27, 17 evaluated um, 31 trials, um, and they included a mini sling, which was then called a TVT's um, Secure, which is no longer manufactured. And again, the meta-analysis reported that significantly more patients had ongoing incontinence after using the mini sling than the um, then the, the other slings, 41% versus 26%. Now, the mini sling is a very short sling that you make a single incision in the vagina and then out through the obturator foramen. So you, you miss all the neurovascular structures, but it looks like it's not as effective. Um, we will see in our study. Um, yeah. And then I'm um, almost concluding with a more recent thing, the use of bulking agents. Um, so the National Institute of Health, uh, Care and Excellence, NICE, and the American College of Statisticians and Gynecologists suggest that periurethral bulking agents should be considered as one of the several treatment options for patients with decreased um, urethral mobility. Uh, the overall complication rates of bulking agents are very, very low. However, in the older particle-based agents, there appear to be some adverse events such as extrusion, and foreign body reactions. And I just um, wanted to, these, most of these are not available in South Africa anymore, um, unless you have old stock somewhere. Um, the GAX collagen, this was made of bovine dermal collagen. It was cross-linked with glutaraldehyde. Um, and the purpose for that was to reduce um, antigenicity. And that was in 1989. We also had macroplastique before. Um, this was a hydrogel suspended cross-link um, polydimethylsaloxane or silicone particles described in 1991 and then the durosphere which was carbon coated zirconium beads um, reported in 2001 so you can see these are particulate um, bulking agents okay but now what we have is a non-particulate bulking agent um, that everybody know I can't say the name but it's called bulkamid um, and that is just a, a sort of a comparison for comparison sake between bulkamid and the TVT. And you can see, obviously, the bulk, that, that the tape is much more effective than the bulkamid. Um, but um, compared to the side effects or the complications, um, it's close to zero for the, uh, it won't be zero because it's a surgical procedure, but it's close to zero um, for the complications. OK, so bulkamid basically is a homogenous gel um, without particles. It was granted FDA um, approval for bulking. It is comprised of a polyacrylamide hydrogel, PAHG, 2.5%, uh, that is suspended in 97.5% water. Um, it's also non-biodegradable. 
um, the volume of the material is injected into the urethra and it provides a bulking effect. It's injected about one centimeter below the bladder neck um, in the urethra. And then um, the network of fibers then form an anchor for the gel to sit there. They, they, they work by improving the coaptation of the urethra during the storage phase. And the bulking material also acts as a central filler volume, which means it strengthens the, the length of the muscle fibers and therefore improve the, the strength of the sphincter. Um, ideally, a bulking agent um, should be non-reabsorbable, non-immunogenic, non-allergenic, and biocompatible to reduce the risk of inflammation and fibrosis. Or so bulkama does have all of those um, um, features. Uh, what does the IC, um, ICI, the National Consultation on Incontinence, say about bulking agents? Bulking agents should be not be offered as first-line therapy um, for those women desiring one-time solution because it has to be repeated. Um, it is an option for selected individuals, those who are poor candidates for surgery or those who desire a quick office space minimum invasive procedure. Um, it can be offered as a therapy for a current persistent uh, following anticontinent surgery. Um, and of those, these outcomes are likely to be inferior uh, to repeat surgery in the long term. Um, and then the ease of the minimal anesthetic then should be balanced um, against the need for repeat injections. And we know from the latest study that Balcomet can be effective for up to seven years at least. Okay. And that's basically the surgical management of stress incontinence that we see every day. But I thought I'll just mention some of the others, just out of interest. And one of them is the non surgical transurethral radio frequency collagen denaturation of the bladder. Uh, there's accumulating clinical evidence that uh, this procedure is an effective and safe therapy in the spectrum of treatment options for women with stress incontinence due to bladder neck hypermobility. Um, it does not result in anatomical changes and therefore it doesn't preclude subsequent surgical procedures if needed. And then um, it offers them an office-based minimally invasive treatment option with minimal disruption of their daily activities. Now, as you can see there, I just want to quickly describe it. Um, the radio frequency probe is inserted until the probe tip is within the bladder lumen. Um, the balloon is then inflated and the device is withdrawn. And then uh, 23 gauge nickel titanium needle electrodes are deployed into the bladder neck. Um, and this is then connected to a radio frequency generator. Um, and the cycles of 60 seconds are injected into the bladder neck there. The idea is that it will increase the formation of collagen. Another option is your artificial urinary sphincter. Um, this may be inserted either by transabdominal or transvaginal approach. The device is composed of three parts, an inflatable cuff, pressure regulating balloon, and a pump. And the cuff is then placed circumferentially around the bladder neck, and the balloon is positioned in the previsical space. The pump is placed in the labia majora. Um, so when the pump is compressed, fluid within the system is transferred to the cuff into the regulating balloon, and decompressing that balloon opens the bladder neck and allows the patient to void. Okay. Um, my last, second last slide. Um, what about stem cells? The scientific basis of stem cell use for stress incontinence has evolved in recent years. There's new evidence supporting autologous muscle derived from stem cells. However, direct comparison between the stem cell types are lacking. There is no consensus on the optimal cell type to use the location to inject the volume, the concentration of cells. And so the long-term outcome is lacking at the moment, and it remains an area of future studies. But um, it is investigational with some promising um, results. And then I already mentioned the issues with the laser. Um, I just want to conclude to say again that effective management of stress incontinence requires a coordinated effort from a healthcare team to ensure patient-centered care, optimize outcomes, and enhance patient safety. Um, this collaborative approach fosters a comprehensive management strategy for individuals with stress incontinence, and we aim to enhance the patient quality of life and achieve optimal clinical um, outcomes. So. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Plachnut. Um, because of time, we will not be taking any questions. I think there were four questions on the chat. Um, I want to look at them at the back, and they were all related to Dr. Mulukwan. What we'll do, we'll take those questions, send them to Felicia, then she will answer them, and then um, we will forward them to the people who have asked questions. It remains for me to thank every one of you, those online and the people that are here present um, this morning for taking your valuable Saturday off to come and listen to our great speakers. And I also wish to thank our speakers. I think they did a great um, lots of justice and good work when they were preparing and presenting these patients to us. And I want to want us to give them a round of applause, please. Thank you. I think that was excellent. I think all of us have learned something and um, we all have something to take home this afternoon. And I want to thank Alison and the technical staff also, as well as SASOC for making sure that this um, meeting becomes a success and it takes place here in Port Elizabeth. And um, to everyone who's here and everyone joining online, thank you. Enjoy the rest of your Saturday with your families and thank you. <laughs>